Holy crap. People persist in doubting the evidence. Don't run and hide. Don't be afraid. Don't turn away any longer. The truth will set you free. You're listening to Jimmy Church Fade to Black on the Dark Matter Radio Network. We're turning all of our antennas towards the Church on Dark Matter Radio. <laughs> and now, your host, the captain of conspiracy, the prince of paranormal. This ain't your daddy's radio network show. This is Jimmy Church, Fade to Black. Just gonna listen to this for a minute. All right. The toll a tapping is over. All right. Let's go. Let's go. Let's get this one cracking. Man, tweet deck on Monday. <laughs> you guys all right? Need to get your fix on. It's all right. We're all together now. We can hold hands. This is Fade to Black. Bespoke radio for the masses. Monday, September 1st. That's right. I hope everybody has had a great, safe Labor Day weekend so far. Eat, drink, be merry. I asked everybody over the weekend, what are you doing? You grilling out? What are you doing? Then I posted the pictures. Yeah, we got it on. We did ours yesterday. It was uh, pretty epic. We are 243 days into the new year. Live from the JP Motorsports Studios right here in Burbank, California for KJCR and the Dark Matter Radio Network. I'm your humble host, Jimmy Church. Welcome everybody listening around the world, across the United States. I was going to mention the uh, feed problems right now that you should just go over to tune in, but you couldn't hear me say it anyway. I think everybody's caught up. Everybody's on tune in. I can see that. Everybody is ready. Oh, big proud salute to the men and women in uniform defending that constitution of ours. Freedom of speech. Allowing this show to happen. Allowing you to tweet and email and comment and call in. Uh, Robert... Noel Jr. just said he switched to the HTML player. Yeah, I don't know where the feed problems are, but tune in is is pretty rock solid. So there you go. Tune in also uh Talk Stream Live, TSL. It's all good. All right. Where are we? We've got so much to cover tonight. You know what I wanted to do really quick? I want to do a a, a country roll call. A country roll call on Twitter. What country are you listening from? And then (laughs) I want to know what state. What state? What city and state? I mean, there's there's hundreds of tweets flying by right now. So a quick roll call. What country and then what state and what city? Okay? And I'm just going to watch that click by, and I'll read off what I can as they pop, 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 pop. Like an Uzi, like a slot machine at Caesars tweet deck. I try to keep up, though. I I don't know how you guys do. I really don't. Last week, last Friday, did a tally on the columns. Dudes, (laughs) dudettes, Republic of Texas, Republic of Texas, Sacramento, Ontario, Canada, there we go. That's what I'm talking about. Just watching these fly by. Whoa, a couple of Canadas. Okay. Let's see, there's a Pennsylvania. 
Arcadia, Ohio. There's a such a place. Colorado, Poncha, Poncha Springs, Henderson, Nevada, Asheville, North Carolina. Just watching these click by Middleborough, Massachusetts, Melbourne, Australia. That's from Ace, Philadelphia, Edmonton, Alberta. Yeah, Canada's coming in strong tonight. Keep it coming. Keep it coming. Battle Creek, Michigan. Been there many times. Very cool. I think one of the coolest names of any city in America. Another Edmonton. Newark, Delaware, the first state. Fordland, Missouri. The Conch Republic of Florida. (laughs) Fordland, Missouri. Queensland, Australia. Sydney, Australia. Wow. Australia. Australia strong. Australia is strong. Where's Ireland tonight? Where's the UK? That's what's missing here. Doesn't make any sense. What about the Netherlands? Huh? 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 Belgrade, Belgrade, Serbia, coming in strong. Wow. Cookville, Tennessee. Sac, sac a tomato. <laughs> what? Sacramento, California. Hickory, North Carolina. Canada will always be strong, and they're full of conspiracy nuts. That's from Nicole McDonald. Philadelphia comes in from J1MZOR, zero R. Keep them coming. I want to know. I want to know where everybody is tonight. This is great. All right. Today, are you ready? Australia, are you ready? (laughs) South Africa? South Africa coming in. Another Bosnia and Herzegovina coming in. Another uh, Texas, of course. Texas, Texas, Texas. Pittsburgh. Another Ontario, Canada. Boston. Keep it clicking. I want to see this click. I want to just go pop, pop, pop. I want to know. But no UK and no Ireland. No Scotland. Germany. And I know they're listening. They just don't tweet, apparently. Washington, D.C. Another Pittsburgh. Another Ontario, Canada. Bluefield, Virginia. We know who that is. We know who that is. That was an epic Thursday with uh, Steve from Bluefield. Today, are you ready, Australia? Your governor, prime minister, Barry Gibb is 68 years old. Barry Gibb. Still looking good, too. Still got the pipes. Barry Gibb. Now, today, sad because we talked about this when it happened. Our Fort Wayne, Indiana. That's what I'm talking about. Fort Wayne. Fort Wayne. Okay. All right. Now, I'm going to glance over. <laughs> Let me get back to the show. Keep it coming. Kansas, keep it coming. All right. We talked about this back in March when it went down. Okay. Ah, uh, UK just came in. Sheffield, that's what I'm talking about. Uh, we got another one. Uh, another Aussie. Buffalo, New York. James, our dead guy birthday today is James Rebhorn. Born in 1948. Dar- died in March of this year. And I, I'm such a huge fan of James. All of his, we were watching Scent of the Woman the other day. He always seems to play that same role, too. Oh, it was easy for him. I mean, you know, casting director, when they were casting James, they knew exactly what they were getting. And, uh, but James uh, died back in March. But his lines, you know, if you're going to, if you just want to have le- that legacy, you know what you want, especially as an actor, but you just want people to quote you forever. And James will always have that. All of his lines from my cousin Vinny when he was on the stand. Amazing. But to me, his best was Independence Day when he turned to uh, the president. He said, uh, Mr. President. That's not entirely accurate. (laughs) James Rebhorn. Uh, Born this day, died back in March. Also, today, 
How apropos. Today was the kickoff of World War II. Germany invaded Poland on this day. And to uh, help us in all of the memory of, uh, of World War II, this week is Third Reich Week here on Fade to Black. Tonight, Harry Cooper. Harry, um, as you're going to find out tonight, if you don't know much about Harry, um, Harry, uh, uh, again, I'll, I will say this. All of your guest requests that you send in, everything is read, everything is researched, we check out everything, and we try to do our best. You know, We, we want the best, the biggest, the brightest uh, guest on this show. Harry Cooper was a guest request. Quick cough. Love that cough button. Harry Cooper was a guest request. Uh, so was so is tomorrow night's guest as well. So uh, and Jim Mars on Wednesday. All of this, uh, Joe Fax tomorrow night. All of this is because of you, and and never forget that. So keep the guest request coming. You can do that a couple of different ways. Jimmy at JimmyChurchRadio.com. Email me direct. You can also go through the webpage. Try to break through Wolanda and Rita. <laughs> and uh, get to us. All right? I do. I, I really do. I read them all. And and it's funny because with this show, I have my favorites. I have my you know people that I look up to and stuff that I find interesting. But it's always, when the guest request comes in, it's like, oh, yeah. Yeah. You know, it stirs the memory. And it's it's great. It's absolutely great to be able to do that. So follow us on Twitter, at J Church Radio. That's what you want to do. Come hang out in the sandbox tonight, which is hashtag DM Radio Net. You do want to follow us on Twitter, at J Church Radio. All the action that I'm talking about, bam, 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 is going down on Twitter right now on TweetDeck. That's what you want to do. You want to come hang out with us. Hashtag DM Radio Net. We are all friendly over here. Nicole McDonald just tweeted, this guy is top notch, Harry Cooper. Harry, okay, right now, sample of listener locations. This is coming in from Dark Matter Radio Direct. United Kingdom. Uh, we got Gainesboro, Tennessee, Home Firth, G, uh, another United Kingdom, Columbian Falls, Montana, Hermosa, South Dakota. Really? Not Hermosa Beach, but Hermosa, South Dakota. Right now. So cool. And that just got tweeted. And so that's what you want to do. Come hang out with us. It's all good. At J Church Radio. Hashtag DM Radio Net. Later tonight, we will have open lines. Harry, uh, the call-in number is 323-825-5045. Harry has lived, uh, I mean, 10 lives. It's remarkable what he has done. And I was talking to Harry about a week ago, and uh, we got off onto a, a, a NASCAR IndyCar tangent in the conversation. Dude was a, a, a super speedway NASCAR driver. So I went and instead of I could have posted all these really cool pictures of of Harry down in Argentina doing his investigating, you know, all the uh U-boat stuff, could have done all of that. Him in uniform, could have done that. No. Harry Harry busting a move at 190 miles an hour at Texas Motor Speedway next to I think I could be wrong. Looked like um uh, 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 one of the Allisons. I, that's what it, the car looks like. But anyway, that's <laughs> that, if you have ever, if you've ever, most people haven't. But if you've ever done over 120 miles an hour in a car, you know what white knuckle situation you are under. You do 122, 123, 125. Now you're getting stupid. You get to 130. And you are out of control. Dark Matter Radio just posted what's going on right now in the United States with uh, with this with this broadcast. That is crazy. That is nuts. Welcome everybody listening. Now, if you've ever gone that fast, now if somebody's ever told you, "Hey, man, 
Yeah, man, I've done 150. I've 100, 160. Nah, they're lying. They're exaggerating. That is fast. And you need to have a big, long stretch of road in front of you with no bumps, miles, to get up to that kind of speed. Harry did it for fun. <laughs> buck 90, buck 95, 200 miles an hour in a 426 Hemi. That's insane. That's a man's man. And tonight he's going to spend the next two, two and a half hours with us. An absolute gentleman. I was uh, talking to Jim Mars actually yesterday about Harry. And he's like, you have no idea. Out of all of the researchers that I know around the world, Harry is the guy. Harry gets it done. Harry knows people. He's a guy that I really respect. And that came from Jim Mars. And that's who we have on the show tonight. I, I'm just, just, I cannot wait. So when I come back after the break, I'm going to get to a bunch of email. Clyde Lewis update. Dr. J, Andy, Elias update. And a bunch of your email. And then we're headed to the bottom of the hour. When we're going to bring on Harry Cooper. Sharkhunters.com. Over on the website, there's a couple of... Uh, couple of galleries posted. I will get to those too. Got a special church rant tonight about the red light district in the Pacific. This is Fade to Black, Bespoke Radio for the masses. Welcome everyone. This is Bespoke Radio, only on the Dark Matter Radio Network. I'll be back right after this. Stay with us. You're listening to Jimmy Church Fade to Black on the Dark Matter Radio Network. What's up, revolutionaries? It's me, Jimmy Church. Do you have an IRS or state tax issue? Well, I did, and I called national tax experts. My problems were fixed, done, fini, and man, I got to tell you, it was a relief. National tax experts are a recognized tax office that services clients in all 50 states. It doesn't matter where you live. Give them a call. I'm telling you, they take the time to understand each and every client's individual financial status as well as their financial goals. And that's exactly what you need, my brother, when you're taking on the evil three letter. So, seriously, give them a call today at 1-877-909-5444. Again, 1-877-909-5444 or go check out their website www.nattaxexperts.com that's n-a-t-t-a-x-e-x-p-e-r-t-s dot com tell them Jimmy sent you this is KJCR at jimmychurchradio.com on the dark matter radio network <laughs> All right, everybody, welcome back. Fade to Black. Fade to Black, bespoke radio for the masses. I'm your host, Jimmy Church. Special Labor Day, Labor Day show. Third Reich week right here on Fade to Black. Uh, tonight, Harry Cooper. Tomorrow night, Joe Fex. Joe Fax has got like three tons of UFO photos. We've got a bunch of stuff we're going to post tomorrow night, never before seen stuff. It's absolutely going to freak you out. He is in possession of some of the greatest collections uh, in the world, period, bar none. He's got them all. And uh, he's going to be on with us tomorrow night. And then, of course, Wednesday, wrapping up uh, Third Reich Week, will be Jim Mars, live from Texas. Tonight, Harry Cooper. All right, a couple of things. Uh, Betty Oliver was the first to hit me with this uh, on Facebook. Then, of course, the emails came in and the text and so forth. Clyde Lewis was admitted to a hospital up in Vancouver, Washington. He was diagnosed with a pulmonary embolism. He'll be staying approximately three days while they clear it. 
And this came directly from them. They said, thank you for your support. Uh, Clyde is at the moment of this posting awake and resting. I immediately texted Clyde and said, dude, just behave and leave the nurses alone. Okay. All right. And uh, so by all indications, I guess uh, Clyde uh, pulled through. And I will uh, follow up on that with his team up there, and we'll get an update for everybody tomorrow night. But our thoughts and prayers are with you, Clyde. All right? And uh, he's a friend of the show, host to host, Clyde Lewis. And it's kind of strange that uh, another one of our uh, broadcasting family, Dr. J, Dr. J Elias, uh, he's still in the hospital. I did go by the hospital on Friday, and uh, they wouldn't let me see him. And uh, he's an ICU, and uh, there you go. I did my best, by the way, to uh, to talk my way into his room. The nurse would have nothing to do with it. His family wasn't there, so they wouldn't let me in, and uh, and I couldn't get an update directly from his family. So, other than that, everything is private and personal. But uh, uh, there you go. So, Dr. J, again, our thoughts, hopes, and prayers are with you. And uh, we've uh, got to get you back out of the hospital, man, because you've got a show to do before hours on Dark Matter Radio. And I guess that's a little selfish on my part, but uh, we need you, brother. We need you, Clyde. So, everybody, please, let's uh, hopes and prayers. All right? Let's send it all out. Get the vibe going very important. This is a very, very small community uh, that we have here. And it's kind of funny that two two of our own go down over the weekend. Okay. All right. Email uh, from Ben Miller. He says, wow, September 1 through 3 schedule looks big. Speculation and evidence of post-World War II Hitler survival is very intriguing. Jim Mars is always a great listen. Mr. Fex has an interesting collection. We are going to have a good week. That was from Ben Miller. Couldn't agree with you more. It's going to be pretty great uh, get through all of this. This came in from from our friend Don um, uh, Druniak. He says, apparently, he sent me a, he posted, <laughs> he posted a picture of the Malibu base and, uh, and, and put a funny comment around, wow, this is a, check this out. Check out this pic. It's breaking news. And uh, so I wrote him back. He wrote me and he said, apparently you've been scooped. I have it from an impeccable source that this is the first of what is going to be a chain of underwater alien burger drive-ins. That was from Don, but I'm bump. And uh, from Lou, Lou's all upset with me because I said that Jack the Ripper was a hoax. He's like, what? So Lou has a way of uh, when he writes me an email, he doesn't put anything in the body. He, he, he doesn't write. All of his email is in the subject line. That's all he did. He doesn't have time to type anything. So his correspondence goes with the subject line. And the subject line, as he replied back, was a hoax. A bunch of question marks. A hoax. Yeah. Jack the Ripper was a hoax. <laughs> That's it. And and he he doesn't get it. And I do mean it. Yeah, Jack the Ripper was a hoax. A great story. But you got to remember the difference between legend and legendary and urban myth and everything else. Jack the Ripper was dreamed up by a drunken journalist named Thomas Bulling. And he wrote a forged letter to Scotland Yard in 1888, pretending to be this guy named Jack. Why? So he could get a scoop for the newspaper that he wrote for. Now, there were a few unsolved murders that, were, that had happened in London at that time. But that's all he wanted to do was get paid. So we could publish some articles. Kind of reminds you of today a little bit, doesn't it? Clicks on bogus websites, fake stories, same thing. But Trevor Marriott 
He's a former murder squad detective with the Bedfordshire Police and spent 11 years carrying out a cold case review of all of the killings. And he went through all of Scotland Yard's files and used all of the modern-day police techniques backed up with all of the -the state-of-the-art stuff that he could to break this case. And I'm going to hear some quotes from him. He said, The facts of this case have been totally distorted over the years. The general public has been completely mizzled by uh, any number of authors and publishers. Jack is supposed to be responsible for five victims, but there were many other similar murders before and after the ones attributed to him, both in this country and abroad in America and Germany. Germany. Bullying was a drunken journalist with many police contacts at Scotland Yard, who in 1888 was working for the London-based Central News Agency. He was paid to supply crime stories for newspapers. Police got a letter that Bulling had written about the murders, which he signed Jack the Ripper. It was the most ingenious piece of journalism that has kept this mystery alive for 125 years. Even now, any modern-day serial killer is called a Ripper. That's it, Lou. It's great. It's a great story. But that's it. Jack the Ripper was a hoax. Did, yeah, did he pretend to kill a bunch of hookers? That just came, came in from Rick. Look, yeah, just go do a little bit of research on Jack. It's a great story. It's a great story. Go, you know, write a book. Make another movie about it. I'll watch it. Johnny Depp. Sure. It's all great. It's all good stuff. I want to say to everybody right now that thank you for the stuff that you guys send us in the mail. It's pretty cool. And I've got, uh, I do have my Lynn Lewis coffee mug. I've got my, I'm drinking out of it now. I also have my Walter Lewis question everything mug. I got my, uh, uh, armadillo tastes like chicken t-shirt t-shirt. Oh, by the way, I'm an honorary, uh, Rita and I are honorary, honorary citizens of Texas. You got those certificates and I've also got a set of space boy shot glasses now. And I gotta tell you, it's just cool. Thank you. Thank you for all of that. And when that stuff pops up like it does, um, it is just, I, I don't even know what to say. I really don't. So, uh, that's it. Let's see. Um, I'll get back to Twitter in a second, but, uh, let's take a quick break. When I come back at the bottom of the hour, Harry Cooper, a couple minutes tomorrow. It's Joe Fex Wednesday, Jim Mars. Yes, it is third Reich week right here on dark matter. And, and don't forget this Thursday fader night. I'll be back right after this. Way out here, we listen to Jimmy Church on the Dark Matter Radio Network. Dark Matter. Dark Matter. Dark Matter. Dark Matter. Dark Matter. Dark matter. You're listening to Fade to Black on the Dark Matter Radio Network. ¿Qué tal, mis amigos? Yo soy Mario Carzanel, tiburón, y los invito para que escuchen a mi buen amigo Jimmy Church Radio. Claro que sí. Oi, oi, I'm Reese Evans. You're listening to Jimmy Church. This is Revolution. The Revolution will not be televised. The Revolution is on radio. Ciao. Welcome back. Fade to Black, only on the Dark Matter Radio Network. Bespoke radio for the masses. Shoot me an email right now to jimmy at jimmychurchradio.com. Follow us on Twitter 
at J Church Radio. That's what you want to do. Hashtag DM Radio Net. I just saw one of the uh, tweets coming by saying uh, the tweet deck is like too full. Hashtag DM Radio Net is overloaded. Wow. Well, uh, <laughs> that's good news. Let's get this one cracking. Let's go. I'm ready. Harry Cooper has had one of the most diversified backgrounds of anyone we have ever met. He joined the Air Force right out of high school with aspirations of being a fighter pilot. Instead, he was sent to the Strategic Air Command base in the Midwest and commanded a six-man team loading special weapons, you know, hydrogen bombs, onto B-47 bombers during the Cold War. After college, he went into business where he would where he climbed the corporate ladder at various companies, ultimately to the position of regional vice president of a fairly large company. During this time, he was also a professional race car driver. First drag racing, where he uh, set a number of national records, then to figure eight racing, to short track stock car racing, and then finally to spending Sunday afternoons at 190 miles an hour on super speedways. During this time, he was also a feature editor for Stock Car Racing Magazine, had a monthly column in an Australian Speedway News and American Racing Magazine. For a short time, he was a newscaster on a Chicago television show called Motorsports International, where he did the news from various Chicago area stock car tracks. Today, he is the founder and president of Shark Hunters International, and he has just published Hitler in Argentina a book that quite possibly could end up rewriting history. I would like to welcome to the program, Mr. Harry Cooper. Harry, are you with us, sir? Yes, sir. Good evening, Jimmy. How how are you tonight? Is everything good? Yeah, everything is uh, is good. We're in the midst of another Florida thunderstorm down here, but other than that, we're in good shape. Check this out, Harry. I was looking through your... uh, photographs uh, uh yeah. of some of your racing stuff and i did notice this is kind of weird but uh i did notice that one of your pictures is from michigan international speedway 1974 for the twin 200 right i was at that race i'll be darned i was at that race and i will tell you um there's a couple of things that that stick out in my mind uh memory about that race number one uh Drew Pearson and uh, and Richard Petty were dueling like on the last two or three laps, you know, door handle to door handle, and uh, I, I'll, I'll never forget that. And I believe Pearson won that race. Do you remember? Uh, I can go look it up, but that's what yeah, my memory probably says. Would be better, but uh, <laughs> I think you're confusing. Uh, that was uh, Petty was running NASCAR. And uh, I don't don't believe he ran any of the the twin races. He ran the the regular races. But, right. Uh, that 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 was what forty forty odd years ago. Holy smoke! <laughs> well, it flies when you're having fun, I guess. Well, this is the this is the other memory that I have. Um, yeah. They had uh, photo fan day or something. And, right. I remember that part. Sure. I've got yeah. a picture of me. I don't know. If, no, it, it wasn't up on on the stuff I sent you, but. Uh, they let people out of the stands to come down along pit road and they had a, uh, uh, kind of a rope line there to keep people from swarming into the, uh, garage area. And, uh, we, there's a picture of me in my Captain America suit, uh, you know, my driving suit, signing autographs for kids. Uh, and that, that's the high point of those kids time there to actually meet a race car driver and, you know, you got to be really, really nice to those kids because, uh, well, they're kids. That's that's their whole, that's that's their whole dream, I guess. And, and that's one place where I think I told you on the phone where I had problems with Mario Andretti. He just a snotty son of a gun, never wanted to uh, <laughs> uh, sign anything for the kids. So, well, I was one of those kids, and and I remember this is this is, uh, and I'll keep this short, be, be, but because it can go into a long story, but so I went down and I wanted, uh, Pearson's autograph. And, uh, so I go over to that part of the pits and, and I'm standing, standing there and I'm just a little kid and there's just this big crowd around Pearson. 
and and I've got my little piece of paper and I got a pen yeah. and and this guy comes up to me and he looks down and he goes, uh, "Hey, little man, uh, you want his autograph?" I go, "Yeah." He picks me up uh, underneath my armpits. He picks me up, puts me on pit wall right there, uh-huh. right in front of Pearson, and sticks my hand out with a piece of paper on it. Pearson looks up at me, signs it, what's your name, blah, 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 signs it. And then he puts me down on the ground, and this guy comes up to me, and he goes, dude, how do you know Roger Penske? Yeah. <laughs> and it was, you know, and I, it's just one of those. Now, imagine that today. Happy, you can't. That would never no, go dude. down in NASCAR. Uh, now, these spoiled kids that are driving race cars now making 20 million bucks a year salary and uh, all the amenities that, you know, not the same, but <clears throat> Penske's a great guy. He owned, he bought uh, Michigan International Speedway. He put down a $10,000 uh, retainer or something and then ran one of those twin 200s and made a ton of money at it. He was a, he was a sports car racer way back He's older than me, but uh, uh, he was a salesman for Alcoa Aluminum. Right. And he got Chevrolet to cast up some small block Chevy engines made out of aluminum when he was running uh, the sports car circuit. Now he he owns trucking companies and all sorts of stuff. Ferrari dealerships. Yeah. 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 Tremendous success. And he's, he's a decent, decent guy. He was, you know, and for him to do that to me, I'm just a 10 year old little, you know, little punk. You know, standing there amongst a, a huge throng of people, but he, uh, he, I didn't know who he was. I didn't know until yeah. <laughs> you know somebody had said that to me. But you know, the like I said, with with the uh, uh, with security and everything else that we've got going on today, they would never just open up the grandstands at Daytona or no. you know, and just allow just it just come on, <laughs> walk yeah, across the track. Uh, like I say, these these guys they have nowadays a. I, well, I told you on the phone the other day, they're just high-speed computer operators. They're almost a passenger in their own car Well, I, compared I, I, to what we did back when I was racing. I mean, you had to do everything. Well, I still have respect to anybody that's going to do 200 miles an hour. I don't care if oh. it's <laughs> – I don't care what you're driving. Hey, Jimmy, that's uh, the only way to live. I can only – I've gone – I've gotten up to speed. Uh, a couple of times. I can't really say how, when, or where. I'll get myself into some trouble with some very <laughs> cool people. But um, I've been up to speed. I've gotten up to speed. And it's a, it's a frightening experience when you do it. Oh, and, it's not frightening. It's not frightening. It's exhilarating. Oh, man, I'm so <laughs> jealous. I'm, I'm, well, I'm, I'm, yeah, I, was, I, I just uh, was on the phone a few hours ago uh, reserving my car for Germany. I'm leaving for Germany next week. And uh, I told him I wanted the cheapest little pea dinger they had. I said, but the first thing I do is when I get out onto the Autobahn, see if I can hit 200 kilometers an hour with the car, uh, <laughs> which is about 130. And uh, uh, please don't do that with our car. Okay. <laughs> you're I was the, only joking. You're the last person I would want driving the car. You know what? Actually, probably would be the safest at speed. You know, yeah, you've I been there. Had a, you weren't even born the last time I had a chargeable accident. I was 16 years old, and uh, a guy named Donnie Bartoloni caught me and his kid sister in the back seat of my dad's 49 Ford. And him and his gang was looking to uh, rearrange my facial features, so I just went to back out. And backup lights weren't invented yet. I just bumped another car, and that's the last chargeable accident I've had. And did you ever, uh, well, I'm sure you had crashes, um, in when you were racing, uh, did you yeah, have nothing anything, dra- nothing dramatic at 190 at Talladega or something crazy? No, well, no, I never ran Talladega, but no, when I ran Michigan, Texas, uh, Pocono, thank God, no, never wrecked, but we, uh, running Milwaukee one time up there at state fair park. Yeah. I was, I was drafting on Bobby Unzer uh-huh. and, uh, we were we were flying. I think we were running in the top ten, and we were coming through turns one and two, and we were passing a slower car. I won't mention his name. <laughs> um, and I guess he thought he could run with us, and he got going a little too fast. He lost his side bite, and his rear end kicked out, hit my nose. I spun around, went into the wall backwards, and slid down the whole back stretch, and finally came to a stop backwards. 
And my first thought was to unbuckle the seatbelt and get out. And then I saw all these cars coming at me. They were doing about 140 at that point. And I figured, no, I better stay right where I'm at. Yeah, so, well, uh, plus Milwaukee is a you know a small track, and it's a one mile. It's a one mile track, track yeah. so 140 on that track is insane. I mean, yeah, that, <laughs> that is just insane. Now, uh, really quick, before we move on to the good stuff, and I'm a big racing guy, you know that, and everybody on the show knows that. So I can't, you know, I can't avoid a couple of really cool questions. But whatever, Pocono. What it, it, uh, that is such a fast, fast track. Texas, an, an insanely fast track. Yeah. Um, what? Well, which Texas? Are you talking about the new one at Dallas Fort Worth, or are you talking the old one down at College Station? No, College Station. Well, the new one yeah. is all high tech. I mean, you expect that one right. to be fast, but it's a one and a half mile as opposed to Texas World Speedway, which is two mile. Right, which is two mile. Um, yeah. What is it like getting up to speed? Is it easier? Is it easier to do a buck ninety, two hundred miles an hour at at Pocono um, uh, than it is doing a hundred miles an hour on your local freeway? I mean, which would you which would you rather <laughs> yeah. do? Well, on the track, of course, uh, but Pocono is unusual because it's it's only got three corners, right? And the front chute is down there a mile long, and you're you're way back when I was racing, you're pushing over two hundred miles an hour down the front chute, right? And how then did you, you jump on the brakes and take a hard right or uh, left turn? I mean, well, I knew a couple drivers that turned right, but uh, and now I see that they're actually shifting gears. They're downshifting at the top of uh, the the front chute into turn one, and uh, downshifting into third, and then powering back out. It, it, too much. Uh, too, too much, much work. Uh, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> I yeah. Didn't too want much. To say it that way, but yeah, yeah, I can see that. And so, and how? And one last, one last question. And I, I hope you appreciate this. Is this okay. um, today? There's all this data and stats, and you are able to um, uh, know your line at the track before you even get there. You know, they know exactly where you. You know, and all the computers and the chips and the telemetry. But yeah. back then, you didn't have any of that. How did you find your line at at Pocono? How did you find your line at Michigan? I mean, those are big tri ovals. And you're out there, like you said, you're you're out there by yourself. Um, how, yeah, how did you well, find your line? Well, you get to practice, you know, a day or two ahead of time before the race. And then some of the guys who've been racing for years, they know their track because they're there every year. Uh, and for a for a newbie like myself, you just get out there and find one of the one of the old timers during practice and follow him around and get the feel of the track yourself. And uh, then, uh, boy, I'll tell you what. Uh, I, uh, I'd, I'd do it again tomorrow on somebody else's money, <laughs> but not on my own. I don't know how an independent can do it anymore. Cause, uh, you know, just, you know, you're paying the driver and the top name guys they are getting 20 million bucks a year salary and they get a million and a half dollar, uh, Prevo motor home that somebody else drives to the track and back for them. It's just a portable hotel room. And <clears throat> it's way beyond what it was when I was driving. Yeah, absolutely. They have, you know, a, 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 an engine for each race. You had an engine for the whole season, probably. Oh, geez. We were at Michigan, and we were nose-to-nose with Bobby Unzer's car, the, the red K&K Dodge. And uh, they wanted him to set a new track record, so they drained out all the 50-weight racing oil and put in 10-weight, and they taped up the grill to cut down on uh, the uh, drag, and he went out and he set a new record and he destroyed a Hemi engine. And I was sitting on the bench with Bobby and my crew chief was talking to Harry Hyde, his crew chief, while they were changing the engines. And uh, my crew chief, Nick, said, how, how can you justify destroying a Hemi engine for, you know, like that? And then Harry says, well, we got six more in the truck. <laughs> and Bobby Andre gives me a little elbow in the rib. He says, yeah, 22 more in the shop. Uh, I'm thinking, holy cow, I got one engine for the whole year. <laughs> yeah, well, but uh, you, you wouldn't change anything. time in my life, I wouldn't trade it for anything. No, you wouldn't. And those pictures, <laughs> those pictures are precious, man. And yeah. uh, so, okay. And they're, they're even on my website. If anybody wants to see them, go to sharkhunters.com. And then when, uh, when in the upper right hand drop downs, go to about, and then it says something about uh, the veterans, and click on the veterans. And since I'm a veteran, 
I'm on that uh, sheet too. Click on Harry Cooper and away you go. Why number 17? <clears throat> oh, that's a good question. Um, I started out drag racing and I thought stock cars, local stock cars were just junks with a few miles left in them. Well, the guy that owned the Sunoco station that was giving me free gasoline as my sponsor, he called me up from the local stock car track, O'Hare Stadium in Chicago, wanted me to run some parts down there. <clears throat> and, uh, boy, I got a, I got a, uh, an education in a hurry. Those were not just old junks. Those were powerful cars. And then um, he was selling his car, which was happened to be number 17. And uh, I was even more arrogant back in those days as a, as a young punk. <clears throat> so I kept the number and uh, decided to do a lot better with it than he had done. So my very first night out, I had never driven a stock car before. I qualified a tenth of a second faster than the best he had done in four years. I just kept 17 after that. That's it? Yep. <laughs> no big mystery. Okay. No uh, big mystery. Me, uh, I will we'll say to everybody, fade to black 14, which is our Skype number here, uh, our call-in number, fade to black 14. The number 14 is there because that is A.J. Foyt's number. And right. I was the biggest A.J. Foyt fan, still am. Uh, and he was number 14 in USAC, as everybody knows. And and uh, 14 for me has been my lucky number since I was like, I don't know, single digits, that's for sure. <laughs> well, like I told you on the phone, he was the greatest race car driver God ever put on the face of the earth, and he really a decent, really a decent human being. I told you that story. Yeah, but, uh, I, I remember one time I was in the stands. I can't believe we're going to talk racing, but uh, <laughs> we'll, we'll get this. But I was in the stands. It's your show. <laughs> yeah, it is. It is. I was in the stands on the uh, on the pit side uh, on the infield at uh, Indy, and as you know, at Indy, those stand those seats. Well, back then they were they were like uh, they were metal. They were uh, gold colored, like bronze. Anyway, so I, I'm there. And there's the big entrance, uh, the, the the grandstand split, and that's where they bring the cars in and out of uh, Gasoline Alley, uh, the garages. Right. And I'm there. And uh, th so that section on both sides, people would crowd to see the drivers when they came out. You know, they'd walk out and they would yell. And, uh, and AJ was coming out of Gasoline Alley, and he would always have his pit crew wore checkered shirts, right? Right, and red and white checker. Red and white checker shirts, and there was, a, and he had a he had a big pit crew, and everybody wanted to wear those Gilmore shirts. But anyway, <laughs> yeah. So they, he's coming out, and he's got like thirty, forty guys with him, and you would see those checkered shirts coming, and everybody crowded, and to hear them yell AJ, AJ. Right. Um, and now all the other drivers would come out, Andretti, you know, whoever, Emerson, Fittipaldi, whoever's walking out, Gordon Johncock, Tom Sneva. You know, Rutherford, okay. AJ came out, and that place erupted. Yeah. And, and I, it's just something that stuck with me ever since. AJ was just a guy that was very, 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 very well-respected. Um, yeah, he was it, an ass-kicker, too, when he got behind the wheel. He just never settled for second. He just, you know, uh, you know, God forbid any uh, newspaper person or, or reporter came up to him uh, after a race and said, well, hey, you did all right. You finished second. Well, <laughs> he got punched as an insult. Yeah, he got punched. <laughs> yeah, yeah, he, he did he, punch out a few. Yes, he did. Uh, yeah, back in the old day before, uh, like today, these candy asses run off and call the police. You can't do that anymore. <laughs> oh, Harry, you're killing well, me. Hey, I had that my assistant crew chief, uh, we called him Stubby, was uh, five foot 11, weighed 280 pounds, and his biceps were bigger than my thighs. And Drivers always used to like to fight with each other, and I wasn't all that big. So if anybody would come around to give me any grief, I'd just tell them, Stubby, take care of this man. <clears throat> and Stubby always carried a two-foot-long screwdriver with a, about a five-pound handle on it. <laughs> so, <clears throat> nobody ever wanted to fight with me uh, Stubby was always there. Uh, let's, I, I could do this for the next two hours. You know what? what we'll, you know what we will do? Uh, we'll warn everybody ahead of time. Um, uh, the next show, you and I will just talk racing all night. I'll, I'll do that all. That'll night. work. Not a problem. Not too many. <laughs> not too many 
uh, ufology paranormal conspiracy guys know what the Marmon wasp is. Okay, but I oh, do. God. <laughs> okay, I do. So uh, never forget that. Um, Harry, you've lived uh, uh, a dream life for most people. I know you just laugh at that uh, when you hear that. I know you hear it all the time, but uh, yeah. you've done everything that you've really wanted to do. Have uh, or is there is there anything left on the agenda? Well, geez, I don't know. Uh, well, there was something that uh, was not on the biog that I sent you. I used to collect hard to collect debts for some uh, <clears throat> Italian guys in Chicago. But uh, we won't get into that. That was for a short time. Wow. And then I went to live on my boat in the Bahamas because things got a little heated around there. But, no, there's nothing left uh, that I really want to do. Um, I got into uh, the study of the U-boats when I was living on my boat in the Bahamas. Uh, I sold my race car, um, <clears throat> quit my job as, a, as an executive with a big company in Chicago and went to live in the Bahamas on my sailboat. I put an ad in Cruising World magazine for female crew companion, got over 200 replies, whittled it down, whittled it down, and finally I left Chicago with a blonde, a brunette, and a redhead that were 24, 24, and 25 years old, and I was 40. And I went to live in the islands, <clears throat> and the best thing about it, uh, there was no stress. Stress kills you. Um, and while I was there in the islands, I ran across uh, an island that had been a plantation during the war years, and there was a ruined mansion on a, on a hilltop and uh, the remains of a barracks building and a radio shack down in the underbrush. And the old caretaker told me that <clears throat> during the war, they gave fresh water and food to some German U-boats. Now, whether that was true or not, we haven't been able to determine, but my first my first reaction was those dirty Nazis, because that's what we were taught. Germans were all Nazis. They pray to Hitler because they hate God. They machine gun helpless people in the water for sport. Uh, <clears throat> so, but then I put that in the back of my head because I had three more important things to worry about, Karen, Lynette, and Debbie. <laughs> so finally, after some years, I reached into my wallet, and I had five bucks left, so I Sailed back, put the boat in the marina in Florida, hitchhiked home, mooched a room from my sister, and went back to work. And then I started researching and found out this was not true. Uh, they were not raving Nazis or anything else. Uh, actually, there were no Nazis in Germany. There were Socies. They called themselves Socies. Socies, short for National Socialist German Workers' Party. Nazi was a propaganda term, but, you know, we won't split hairs on that. But they were not raving anything because in the in the German Navy, they were not allowed to belong to any political party. And in the early stages of the war, when they'd torpedo a ship, many times the submarine would surface and give aid to the survivors. Um, the... Uh, one of our members, we have members, um, and there's information about that on our website, sharkhunters.com. Uh, <clears throat> one of our members, Peter Chelamitos, was an officer on a ship that got torpedoed in the North Atlantic and sunk. His crew all made it into the lifeboats, and the U-boat surfaced and came alongside and uh, asked if anybody needed medical help. They were going to give them medical help. And uh, <clears throat> fortunately, nobody needed medical help. So the U-boat skipper said, uh, I'd like to give you some fresh water, but our water is all bad, so would it be okay if you take a couple cases of beer instead? So they gave him a couple cases of beer, gave him a compass, told him which direction to steer to get to land. And it was that way through the whole first part of the war until the anti-submarine um, efforts of the Allies got so good that a, a U-boat didn't dare stay on the surface. Then I researched even farther and found that the German U-boat force, the U-boat Waffe, suffered the worst casualty, uh, the worst attrition rate of any military force ever in history. <clears throat> uh, as a comparison, the United States Navy submarines had the worst attrition of any American force during World War II. You think of the Marines, you think of the paratroopers, but in the American submarines, one man out of seven got killed. That's a high ratio. But on the German side, it was the reverse. 
one man out of seven came home. We never found any uh, reports of desertion. They always stood in line to join. They went out. The average age of a skipper at the end of the war was 23 years old. The average age of a crewman was 17. And they went out and they died. 30, about 30, 31,000, <coughs> excuse me, out of 39,000. And I felt it was just wrong for history to paint them as raving, evil, nasty people when they weren't. They were decent, honorable young men. They were just kids in the service. Like I was a kid in the service, 18 years old, I joined up. I wanted to kill Russians because we were told we had to kill Russians. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> now I'm an honorary Russian submarine officer. <laughs> yeah. And uh, <clears throat> I was uh, invited to uh, the Soviet Union. Mikhail Gorbachev ordered his uh, five-star fleet admiral, Vladimir Chernyevin, to extend an invitation to me when it was still the Soviet Union. And they actually made me a commissar of the Soviet Union in the Peace to the Oceans Committee. And it turns out they're no different than anybody else. The average soldier, you know, I mean civilized soldier, not, not these crazy people in the Middle East right now, but the average civilized soldier, German, Italian, French, Russian, American, British, whatever, they're just young men, patriotic to their country, and they're told you got to hate this bunch or you got to hate that bunch. And so you do, and you serve your country, and uh, then you find out later. You know, we had we have conventions all the time, <clears throat> and the veterans would get together, American, German, whatever, and they uh, they got to trying to out drink each other, and they found they were not different at all. They just wore different uniforms. Yeah. So that's what got me into uh, the U-boat, and I. I walked off my job again. I was vice president of a big company at that time. <clears throat> and in 1982, I'm sorry, 1983, Shark Hunters was born. And it was just a little one-page newsletter <clears throat> I was sending out at that time. And uh, it's now a full magazine, mostly electronic, though. Uh, we do have the hard copy for the old people. Uh, but... Come 1987, uh, I had gotten married, not to somebody from my boat trip. I got married in 1985. 1987, I just uh, realized this has to be done full time. So uh, I was a vice president of a company, regional vice president, in charge of six offices around the northern part of Illinois. Uh, I didn't like my boss anyhow, so I just quit without notice. And... Uh, came home. My wife was the secretary at the marina where we were living on our boat up in Fox Lake. And uh, she asked, you know, what am I doing home so early? I told her that I quit my job. I said, we're moving to Florida. We're going to do shark hunters full time. Mm -hmm. And she said, are you nuts? Have you forgotten I'm pregnant? Where's the security? Where's the, uh, you know, the insurance? I said, I don't know. We just have to do it. So we do this full time. And, uh, Contrary to popular belief, I'm not getting rich at this. I don't take a salary of any kind. We have a lot of people on the masthead. There's myself as the president. I don't get a salary at all. My wife runs the office. She gets 200 bucks a week, and she used to be an executive with Lord & Taylor. Uh, my son, his special needs, he's listed as a document coordinator. That means he shreds documents. My daughter, who's a college student going for her doctorate, she's my secretary and all the other volunteers. Nobody else gets paid. Nobody gets paid at all. All the money that comes into Shark Hunters goes to paying phone bills and all that stuff. So, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. But I, I don't look back on it. I wouldn't, I wouldn't have changed a thing because uh, I got to meet so many of these guys. Only 5,000 survived the war. And uh, we be they became members. We became friends. Um, Otto Kretschmer, the top submarine commander of the whole war, sank more ships than some ma navies did. I had my own sleeping room in his house. Uh, Eric Topp, the guy that sank the first American warship by mistake. <clears throat> I've been to his house I don't know how many times. Reinhard Hardegen, the guy who sank the first ship in American waters. I've been to his house I don't know how many zillion times. He's been over here twice. 
he just had his 101st birthday this March, and we sent him, you know, a lot of members send birthday cards. We put them in a box and send them over to Germany. And I got an email about a month ago from his son saying, yes, their father is in great shape, but the children, him and his brother and his sister, they're very nervous because their 101-year-old father still likes driving his car in the countryside. So I told him, well, he should move to Florida. You know, you have to be old to get a driver's license in Florida. <laughs> With, when I was speaking with uh, Jim Mars yesterday about you, he said that uh, uh, he wanted me to tell you hi, by the way, so we, we I just got that out of the way. He said that okay, hi, Jim. Uh, with, um, with shark hunters and your relationships that you have developed with um, uh, members of the, the German Navy, that uh, that has given you a, a genuine insight and inroad that no other researchers have uh, around the world. Everybody else uses your research for, and claims it as their own. And uh, well, <laughs> yeah, and, uh, well, true. you know, and the, this has gone on about you for a long time. I've heard this a lot, but is, uh, have you, uh, okay, this is what I want with that connection and the stories about Hitler leaving Berlin and sailing down to South America, possibly even Antarctica, on a U-boat, is 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 this stuff that you can confidently now say, yes, this actually happened and this is why? Absolutely. Um, way back in, oh, 1988, 1988, um, no, back it up, 1985, we had a new member, a Spaniard by the name of Don Angel Alcazar de Velasco, <clears throat> and he said he was uh, an agent working with the SS Sicherheitsdienst, the uh, SS Secret Service, and he was in the bunker. He sent me a 114-page long letter, typewritten, single-spaced, in which he describes how he worked for the Germans toward the end of the war. He was in the Fuhrer bunker the last three months of the war. He saw Hitler and Eva Braun forcibly drugged under orders of Martin Bormann and removed. And I published that <clears throat> back in 1987. Oh, uh, you can imagine. People thought I was ready for the rubber room. Then, in 1988, another one of our members, Captain Bob Thu, came to visit, <coughs> excuse me, and uh, he retired from the Navy after 30 years, Naval Intelligence, and he was with NSA after that. And he was sitting on our sofa when we lived in Tampa, <coughs> and uh, I asked him if he had ever heard of Don Angel Alcazar de Velasco. He says, oh, sure. We knew he was one of the other guys, and I've also confirmed him with a German spy that I know now. And so I said, well, this, this guy must be nuts. I said, he said that he met with Adolf Hitler in 1952. I said, everybody knows Hitler committed suicide in the bunker. And without any emotion, just like he was asking for a refill on his coffee, Bob says, no, he didn't. We knew he didn't commit suicide. I said, who's we? He said, the intelligence community. We knew Hitler got away. <clears throat> so then... My main, my main thrust is the U-boats. But recently, in the last uh, about 10 years, we're starting to penetrate some of the security. When, when these Germans take an oath, they won't break an oath for nobody or for nothing. And so getting them to open up was next to impossible. But then about 10 years ago, <clears throat> we started finding out about the black boats boats that did not exist on paper. Um, and we even had a couple of members who rode the black boats. And they finally started opening up about where they were going, etc. Nobody, <clears throat> nobody would say who was on their boat, but they told about the various places they went. Then we found a German skipper with the rank of Kapitän Leutnant, which is sort of like a lieutenant commander, a guy named Heinrich Garbers. And he won the Knight's Cross. It ain't easy to win the Knight's Cross. Nope. 
And then you're looking up Heinrich Garbers. Who the hell is Heinrich Garbers? What submarine did he command? Well, he didn't command any submarine. He wasn't in the submarines. He wasn't in the battleships. He wasn't, he wasn't nothing. Who the hell is Heinrich Garbers? He commanded a 90-ton uh, sailing vessel, looked to be about, I think, 45, 50 feet long. <clears throat> okay. What kind of combat does he get into? He was making the run down to Argentina in the early stages pioneering the routes that the U-boats were taken later. He was going in and out of ports on the Argentine coast, primarily a little place called Caleta de los Loros, which means Parrot Cove, at the uh, northwestern corner of uh, Golfo San Matias. In and out, he was bringing people in and out. He was bringing... Uh, material, mostly radio stuff. And then the submarines were coming in and out of the same places. And uh, there was a company in uh, South America, Argentina primarily, called the Lausen Wool Company. Every little town, every little village had a store, the Lausen Wool Company, where they'd buy wool from the farmers and they'd uh, sell you know, general store stuff. Well, <coughs> oh, God, I got a cold coming on. Uh, that was also the spy network was through all the Lausen wool stores. And the one there in the little town by Coleta de los Loros called San Antonio Oeste, you'll have to pardon my Spanish pronunciation, it sucks. Um, that was the headquarters for all the agents coming in and out of South America, and in their main building in Buenos Aires, that's where Corinne Captain Becker had his offices, and he was in charge of all the spy rings in South America. They were very busy people, and uh, oh, I know I've, I'm missing the uh, the theme of our photos, but uh, you know the photos I've sent you. But, yep, we're, we're going to look uh, at those in just a second. Okay. Uh, so we found out all this was going on, and then uh, in 1960, back in the old days, uh, there was a big deal in the newspaper here in the United States that the Argentine Navy had trapped two submarines in a small uh, gulf called Golfo Nuevo. The deepest part was only 300 feet deep. It was only about 30 miles across, and the entrance was only about six or seven miles across. And they had trapped two submarines in there. Well, that, that's like fish in a barrel. But they couldn't get them. They figured they were Soviets, and they were running around chasing them. They saw them every so often. <clears throat> and when they saw them, they realized they were Type 21 German U-boats, and they kept chasing them. Then the U.S. Navy sent down some of their top anti-submarine guys with some really earth-cracking depth charges, and they couldn't get them. I was in the Air Force at the time, and we're just laughing our buns off, you know, because there's that inter-service rivalry. Oh, the Air Force is happy because the Navy can't get the job done. Right, right, right. And uh, then that died down after two or three weeks, but that's in one of my books. And then... In 1995. But what happened with the two U-boats? They just disappeared. They never found them. They never got them. And that was and 1960, like 60. 15 years after World War II. Yeah. And uh, this is a documented fact. Then, uh, then we've got uh, sketches made by some of the guys on the Argentine ships, and we put that in the book. We've got <clears throat> We've got tens of thousands of documents that we had declassified. Uh, one of our guys practically lived at the National Archives for a couple of months, finding all this stuff and getting it declassed six or seven years ago. Uh, and there's, now there's a bunch of FBI files out there on the, uh, on the Internet. Oh, God, look, the FBI knew all about it all along. Yes, thank you, shark hunters. We got all those files declassified. So, but anyhow, uh, 1995, all of a sudden there's a big deal in the papers 
they have found a scuttled German U-boat <coughs> in Caleta de los Loros. They haven't been able to put people on it because that, I mean, that's desolate, that's remote. So right away I called and got an Argentine admiral. Oh, top secret, Senor Cooper, top secret. I told him there's nothing top secret about a Type 7 German U-boat because that was what the picture looked like. I said the Type 7 was old technology in 1942. So every day I'd call him when we get more news. No, top secret, Senor Cooper. Then the next week I started calling him again and I got, what submarine, Senor Cooper? So I figured, well, that's a dead trail. And uh, what else could I do? Well, a couple years later, about five, six years later, I got a call from a, an Argentine naval officer, a uh, lieutenant commander, Capitano de Corveta <clears throat> was his rank. And he said, are you the fellow that was asking about the German U-boat that was scuttled in Coleta de los Loros? I said, yeah. He said, well, I just retired from the Argentine Navy. I can tell you that submarine is there. So we started researching again, and uh, we've opened up some really great contacts in South America. <clears throat> and I've been down there four times to Argentina, um, two times to where Hitler lived from 1945 to 55, been to his estate, and uh, also two times up to Cordova province, which is where he lived after 1955. The little town he lived in in uh, 45 to 55 was suddenly discovered as a tourist attraction, skiing in the wintertime and fishing on a huge, big, beautiful lake in the summer. So he left and moved up to Cordova, which is, <laughs> even by today's standards, it's kind of backwoods-ish. So it, it was out of the limelight back in those days. Well, we're, and, getting, we're getting a little bit ahead of ourselves, so I want to get to that point okay. here in a second. Yeah. So um, were you able to identify which U-boat? Is that how Hitler actually got to Argentina? Oh, oh! before you answer that, let's back up for a second and get back to the bunker. Back nobody, to the bunker. Yeah, nobody in the bunker actually saw anybody shoot themselves, correct? That is correct. There were three uh, SS officers, Linga, Kempka, and Gunsha. Linga was Hitler's uh, valet. Kempka was his driver. Gunsha was his adjutant. <clears throat> they were debriefed, interrogated, whatever you want to call it, after the war, uh, mostly by the Russians. And, yep, they all saw Hitler commit suicide. And then they came down to the facts. Well, they didn't actually see it. Two of them said they heard a gunshot, and one of them said he smelled the, the gunpowder. He didn't hear but a he gunshot, was, but he only heard uh, smelled gunpowder. Yeah, right. right. I don't right. know how you can do that right. <clears throat> in an airtight area. But anyhow, each one gave a story about how he ran into the Fuhrer's personal quarters and saw the, the, the two dead people. And yet the time was wrong. You know, one guy said he went, I'm just picking numbers out of the air, but one guy said he went running in there, it was 10 o'clock in the morning. The other guy said, no, it was noon. The other guy said, no, it was 3 o'clock. Right. Well, <clears throat> something you don't forget. Two of them said that uh, Hitler was slumped over on the end of the sofa, and Ava Brown was slumped over on the other end of the sofa, and her dress was all wet because when Hitler shot himself, he spazzed and knocked over a flower vase and the water got all over her. The third guy went in there and said, no, no, Hitler was sitting in the chair on the other side of the room and Ava Brown was laid out on the sofa. Those are not things you make a mistake on. Uh, you know, did he have three buttons on his coat or four? Well, that, maybe you might make a mistake, but was he in the chair or was he laying on the sofa? So then <clears throat> Linga and Kempka died fairly soon after the war. Guncha would never speak about it again. We knew I knew Guncha. He was a huge man, six foot seven, I think. And um, he was in good physical shape. And some years ago, his wife finally passed away, natural causes. And people started thinking now nobody has anything to hold over his head, so he's going to maybe talk. Well, then he had his 88th birthday, um, and a lot of friends were over there. 
they said he was in perfect health. He was in great shape emotionally. <clears throat> a week and a half later, his housekeeper found him in the sauna at 9 o'clock in the morning. He had been there since 3 o'clock the previous afternoon, and the temperature was set at 185 degrees Fahrenheit. So maybe he really did just have a heart attack in that sauna. Possibly. Or maybe somebody thought he was going to say the wrong stuff. Possibly. Yeah. yeah. Accidents happen. <laughs> <laughs> well, the, one of the things that I think is, is obvious is that after the Soviets had entered Berlin and everything went down in the bunker, that that evidence of, of Hitler and Eva Braun would have just been paraded around, and it wasn't. Yep. Well, exactly. And uh, uh, it was Marshal Zhukov who was tasked with finding Hitler. He had a special squad going to find his body, and after about a week or so, he had to tell Stalin they could find no body that was Hitler's. Um, July of 1945, uh, two month, three months, whatever, after the alleged suicide, Stalin was publicly screaming that England and the U.S. were not doing enough to find Adolf Hitler. Well, if he's dead and you've got his body, why do you want people to look for him? Stalin told Truman that he was in Argentina. Uh, Beetle Smith, who was four-star general, Eisenhower's adjutant, he told, told the press there's no evidence that Hitler's dead. And then these FBI documents we've declassified, mostly from 1945-ish, they knew he got away. They named the finca, which I think means farm, in Spain where he laid over for a month, they named the Estancia, the ranch down in Argentina, where he stayed through the winter until he could arrange passage to his home, the estate <clears throat> where he lived for 10 years after the war. The estate was built in the closing moments of World War II by Mercedes Money, which was supposed to be a vacation home for executives of Mercedes of Argentina, but none of them ever lived there because it was built and as soon as it was ready for occupancy, Hitler and Eva Brown moved in. We met people in the town that met them, that knew them. And like you say, I'm getting ahead of myself because we got photos that will bear some of this out. But. Yeah, and I, and I do want to lay out in, in a linear fashion uh, the timeline of events. Right. And, and this is KJCR Fade to Black on the Dark Matter Radio Network, Bespoke Radio for the Masses. I'm your host, Jimmy Church. We are talking with Harry Cooper. I had to get that station ID in because uh, everybody's been lighting me up. So, well, and the FCC likes you to do we, that, too. We got to do it. I'm 15 yeah. minutes late, but it, it's the way that it is. Harry, when did he actually leave the bunker? Uh, according to Don Angel, it was uh, the day before the alleged suicide. Uh, Don Angel said he saw Hitler and Eva Brown forcibly drugged under orders of Martin Bormann. Martin Bormann wanted to keep the Reich alive. He needed Hitler for a figurehead, so he had him removed. Now, and, at that at that point, I didn't mean to cut you off, but at that point, yeah. uh, Berlin is surrounded, you know, on all four sides. Everything is, is closing in really fast. How did he manage to get out of Berlin? Ah, you made the same argument I did back, in the, back when Don Angel uh, <clears throat> uh, made that statement. Um, I thought Berlin was surrounded by the Red Army at that time, too. And one thing that Don Angel had said in his letter was that Gross Admiral Dernitz was there in the Fuhrer bunker, too, at the end of April. And I didn't see how he could get in or out because the city was ringed by the Red Army. So I called um, Captain uh, Kramer, Peter Eric. Kramer, they called him Ali. He was commander of U-333. He was also commander of a anti-tank battalion after the submarines couldn't go out anymore. He was in charge of Dernitz's personal security, and he says, no. He said that the city was ringed by the Red Army, couldn't get, couldn't get in or out. Okay, thanks. So I thought Don Angel had lied, put his file aside. <clears throat> Two days later, I got a call from Captain Kramer again, he had consulted his own personal diary, and he said there was one sector that the Waffen-SS was defending very vigorously that was open, 
and that Admiral Dönitz was in the bunker uh, on the 20th of April, which was Hitler's birthday. So we proved that it was true. And Don Angel um, and a bunch of people, there was a 20-car caravan got out. Uh, this had nothing to do with Hitler, but I mean, this was Don Angel and a bunch of other SS people got out. And then we found out later that Hitler did indeed get out. Now, uh, his personal pilot and his personal doctor were sent down to Bavaria a day or two before the alleged suicide. Well, why would they send those guys anywhere? The Russians were going to grab everybody. Down in Bavaria is what they were. Uh, the Allies called the Southern Redoubt. That's where they figured the leaders of the Third Reich were going to make a last stand. It didn't work out that way, but that's where they were uh, sending people into every different direction. You'd have to come into this one tunnel. You talk to uh, the people in charge. They'd take white paint like shoe polish or something, put a number on the side of your car, tell you where, where to drive, and uh, that's in, in the book. Uh, Don Angel got the number painted on the side of his car. We got a picture of the tunnel down there, and then they were sent off to different places. Hitler, we are uh, quite certain, flew out of a, uh, uh, an air base, I think it was called Seidlitz, but my pronunciation is not very good. Flew to Spain, and then out of Spain, and we've got a map there that shows how the what the, the Allies called the Rat Line went out of Villa Garcia, a little town up the estuary from Vigo, Spain. That's how Don Angel got out with Martin Borman. That's in my book. And uh, Now, did the it, Allies know... Uh, were they allowing safe passage to these flights? You know, why weren't they shooting the planes out of the air? That's my question. Well, once once Germany surrendered, see, I was a kid during the war years. I remember this. Once Germany surrendered, <clears throat> the Luftwaffe was supposed to stay on the ground. The ships were supposed to come into port and surrender at the closest Allied port, et cetera, et cetera. Mm -hmm. The Army surrendered. Um, they weren't running a whole lot of patrols, and... There was a huge rush to send as many uh, Americans out of Europe fast to the Pacific to finish the war in Japan. Because you remember, that one went on until uh, the atom bombs dropped in August, and then Germany surrendered 2nd of September, mm -hmm. which is tomorrow, mm -hmm. which is also my birthday. Mm -hmm. um, Happy birthday. <laughs> thank you. So... Uh, there's also something called Operation Mercator, which was enacted in the week to 10 days prior to the end of the war. And when I heard about this, uh, I thought my source was was a little goofy, even though this is my number one best agent. We call them SEIG agents, S-E-I-G, means shark hunters, eagle hunters, intelligence group. Operation Mercator like I say, eight, uh, a week to 10 days before the end of the war, Admiral Dernitz sent about two dozen long-range Type 9C submarines to operate off the American coast, and almost 100 Type 7s, which you see in all the movies, to operate around England and a few up in the Arctic, and it pulled all the submarines off the North Atlantic. And the effect there was to pull all the ships off the North Atlantic. All the anti-submarine stuff went along the east and the west side of the Atlantic to hunt the U-boats that were there. That left a, uh, about a 300, 400-mile wide swatch down the 30th, um, what do you call that, the longitude, and the meridian, the 30th meridian. And uh, so the ships could go down there. Airplanes could fly out of Spain. There was, it still was not as totally encircled as we are led to believe. How would he have, did he, okay, so did Hitler, he flew to Spain. Did he jump on a U-boat there or did he fly to Argentina? How did he get to Argentina? We're still trying to track that down, but we're about 90% sure it was on a submarine out of uh, Vigo. And uh, there was a stop-off point. <clears throat> which 
I've got photos of that in here. Um, we'll get to that when we go down the uh, the timeline. And uh, landed at Caleta de los Loros. Now, from this little town there, San Antonio Oeste, there's a rail line that goes north to Buenos Aires, several hundred miles. And remember, we're talking the 1940s. This could have been on the dark side of the moon. It was just desolate down there. Had another rail line heading west <clears throat> to this Estancia San Ramon, which was about 40 miles from where uh, Hitler's estate was. And they got there in the wintertime, so they had the layover at the Estancia until some uh, springtime, <clears throat> and they could get uh, a car, truck, whatever, to drive them up to their to their estate. So when I was there in 2008, my uh, translator and I went to the Estancia San Ramon, which was owned by German interest, as most of the land down there was. And we met with the uh, uh, manager of the ranch, nice young fellow, about 40 years old, spoke perfect English with a German accent, spoke perfect Spanish with a German accent. <clears throat> and he was answering all our questions. And um, we, I, I usually try to ask light questions to get the person in the, in, in the mindset of answering questions and come in with a, with a powerful question. So we're, he's answering questions. And then I just came in. I said, which one of the guest houses did Hitler and Eva Brown stay in when they got here in 1945? You'd think, you know, he would say, well, hey, I'm only 40 years old. That was long before my time. He said, I have been ins instructed. I must not speak about that. Oh, he didn't point and go that one? No, he didn't point and go that one. He just said he was instructed he could not speak about that. Oh, you know, there's a red flag right there. there there's, uh, when it comes to Hitler, and this is the thing, even saying his name is difficult, and this show is in no way you know, glorifying Hitler or anything like that, but we're all fascinated by his ability to you know, control a country like he did and, and try to take over Europe and and it's despicable of everything. But what's fascinating for me when it comes to Hitler is that uh, nobody really has been able to get to the bottom line. Did he get to did he get to South America? Did he die in the uh, did, did he die in the bunker? Whatever really happened to him? It's, it's kind of funny how history and and research and everything else hasn't been able to really pinpoint everything down. You've been there. You've right. been you've discussed this, you've talked to people and um he did live, didn't he? That's yep. the, he did he did survive in Argentina. Now I want everybody to to go over to jimmychurchradio.com. I am I'm opening up the page actually myself as I'm speaking. We have right. uh, we have a huge gallery uh, that Harry has supplied us with. We've got uh, Harry two pictures. Yeah, you, you you sent us twenty two. I used twenty. I, okay. I I I took out the two maps. We took out the two maps because it just makes the gallery cleaner to, <laughs> to, okay. have, to, to have twenty. So we've got uh, uh, four rows of five pictures here. Gotcha. Um, and if your uh, listeners would like to see more. Go to sharkhunters.com and click on previous tours. There are hundreds and hundreds and hundreds Ama of photos. Yes, just amazing. Yeah, just uh, when you go to Shark Hunters, previous tours is what you want to do. I did all of that, by the way. So what we did do, Harry, we did keep everything in, in order in the same um, numbering system that you sent to us. Good. It keeps me from getting confused. I'm old and feeble. No, I'm right behind you. So <laughs> <laughs> I'm just old. Oh, okay. okay. <laughs> now, um, but uh, again, it's it's a it, w when it comes to Hitler. Um, I remember in in the '60s getting out a, an Encyclopedia Britannica. You know, I'm, I'm five, six, seven, eight years old. And maybe I saw Hitler on TV or something, and I grabbed the H, right? The H encyclopedia right. pull it down and open it up and back then it was only you know 20 22 23 years after world war ii it seemed 
you know, back in the '60s, it would have been like yesterday. And in, in, in that, right here we are in 2014, right now, and we think of the Gulf War, the first Gulf War, the second Gulf War. You know, those are 20 years ago now, 25 years ago, right? And but it still seems like yesterday to us. So back then, in the '60s, Hitler and World War II is still fresh on the minds of everybody. Veterans are walking around. My father was in the service back then. Right. So Exactly. Um yeah, and 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 Hitler had a very small page <laughs> in the Encyclopedia Britannica. You you know, it was like uh, nobody wanted to talk about him and I understand why. Yeah. And we still don't today to be honest with you. Um it is such well, let's a Don't go down that road. You and I can do that on a private discussion later but go ahead yeah and you know where i'm going you know and you know so now this first uh the first picture um in the gallery is the cover of your book right now um and the cover of the book which is is pretty cool um yeah. you've you've got the mercedes uh i call it mercedes but you've got the mercedes house here in, in right the estate house yeah the estate house um and then uh, a picture of Ava and and Hitler, and then a U boat down on the bottom. Um, right, that's just a generic just U boat. A, just a generic new boat uh, U boat. But right. you've got um, uh, Bariloche in Argentina um, on the map. That is Bariloche. 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 Right. Okay, and the picture next to that. I want to get to this picture number two. <laughs> right. I called it Hitler old. What, yeah, that's, what is this picture, and where did you get it? That was dug up by a fellow named Abel Basti, who uh, was a member of Shark Hunters, and I met Abel. And uh, he, in my opinion, is the number one researcher of the Third Reich in Argentina, and he dug this picture up. And uh, uh, there's no doubt in my mind that is an old Hitler do you have any idea how old he is in this picture? No, but it looks like pretty close to uh, the end of the line for him. We think he died about 62 or 1962, 63. We're narrowing that down. That's And why did you, how did you come up with that date? From what we learned from people we talked to. And that would have made him how old? Well, he was born 1889. Let's see, 99, 09, 19, 29, 39, 4, 9, 5, 9. Six nine, uh, mid seventies. Yeah, mid seventies. He looks. Uh, he, yeah, he looks pretty ragged in this picture. Well, he was in pretty bad shape when Don Angel saw him in nineteen fifty two, and that whole report is in my book. Um, he had before he even got out of Germany. He had uh, been suff- uh, showing signs of the onset of Parkinson's and uh, a few other problems, plus the stress of you know, the last two years of the war where they were getting their ass kicked every every time you turn around. Uh, the, the once mighty Waffen-SS armies were being decimated, overrun by sheer numbers of uh, Soviet soldiers. Stalin had, had no qualms about using up a million soldiers uh, just to gain some ground. He lost 20 million soldiers during the war, 20 million military and then 20 million more that he had executed. Stalin just was a fun guy. <clears throat> so, anyhow, did you want to go on to number three? Yeah, well, yeah, before we do, one of the questions okay. that I have, and I was going to get to this earlier, it, it just got posted on Twitter, too, or the idea, which is why, um, and I understand, you know, the amount of Germans and and so forth that wound up in South America, and it seems like every country down there, but... And I understand that, but why would uh, and who would want to keep Hitler alive and who funded everything? Where did this money come from to keep <laughs> him alive? Oh, boy, oh, boy. We cover all that in the book, too. And if you don't mind, we'll leave that off until we get to that part on here. Or I'll cover it now, as you wish. Yeah, well, who, who paid for all this? Martin Borman went down there, too. And there were submarines that brought down tons of... Uh, treasures, plus Borman had the numbers to all the Swiss bank accounts. And if you remember, well, you don't remember because you're not old enough, but if you look at your history, 1945, Juan Perón was a colonel with no property and not much money. 
1947, Juan Perón had a ton of money, was a general and president of Argentina. And his wife, Evita, although she was a, she was a hooker when he met her, she was incredibly sharp business-wise. And so the money came in through many ways. Martin Bormann brought some of it. There was also the, uh, a couple of German banks. One, the Banco Transatlantico Aleman, the German Transatlantic Bank. One of the directors of that bank was a guy named Ludwig Freude. And he was instrumental. He was one of the 10 wealthiest men in South America. He was instrumental in funneling money through from one bank to another to ultimately him to help fund what what you guys know as Odessa. You know what Odessa was? Mm-hmm. Or I should say what Odessa is. Is. Uh-huh. And uh, the Germans called it Die Spinner, the spider. Funneled tens of millions of dollars down through that. And when the war was over, um, the... Allies or whatever wanted Ludwig Freude extradited uh, to stand trial as a war criminal, and Perón said he's my personal friend and he ain't going anywhere. So that's where the the majority of the money came, and we're talking serious money, huge amounts of money, billions. Did how many? When you go to Argentina. And yeah. you hang out. Well, Buenos Aires is one consideration, but you know, out outlying towns and villages. Uh, yeah. Do you see like blonde hair, blue eyed families running around? Oh God, yes. You do, don't you? Oh, geez. When I first went there, uh, my my translator and I flew from Buenos Aires to this little town, San Carlos de Bariloche, which is seven hundred miles southwest of Buenos Aires. And it's still way out in the middle of nowhere, but in, in World War II in 1945, like I say, it could have been on the dark side of the moon. It was so remote. Mm-hmm. We landed. This was 2008 I was there. We landed, got out of the plane. You could have thought you were in Bavaria. Right. All the homes, the buildings, they were all in the Bavarian style or Swiss style, right at the foothills of the Andes. And uh, so we went to dinner that night, uh, my translator and I, and Abel Basti photos of that are on my website too and uh, went to this nice little restaurant and the owner met us at the door he was about uh, six foot tall blue eyes blonde hair old guy though 80 years old and he doesn't speak english i don't speak spanish and uh, he was explaining the specials <clears throat> to my friends in spanish they were telling it to me in english and it wasn't working so on a, just on a hunch, I said, bitte mein Herr, ich möchte eine Speisekarte mit English schreiben. Please, sir. A, like a menu English in menu. English? Yeah, right. And bingo, just like that, it comes back. Oh, mein Freund, haben Sie nicht? <laughs> my friend, I don't have it. And we talked for about two minutes in German. And then I said, uh, du sprichst so gut Deutsch, warum? You speak good German, why? All of a sudden, oh, uh, uh, mm, ich bin Schweizer. I'm Swiss. Sure you are. So, uh, we were eating some, some great Argentine steak, and he was he and he had a little short, swarthy gaucho buddy. They were making music. The, the gaucho buddy was playing a guitar, and our friend was <clears throat> playing what's called a chiffre clavier, which is like an accordion only with buttons on both sides, no keys. <clears throat> and they were singing gaucho songs, so I went over to him and asked him if he could play the Matrosen lead, the sailor song which the u always sang when they were heading out of port to go into combat. Oh, no, don't know that one. Oh, they okay, knew it fine. note for note. <laughs> yeah, so we're back there eating <laughs> steak. Stop. And maybe five, ten minutes later, right. suddenly we hear, Exactly. And he went through the whole Matrosen lead. Then he went through the whole Panzer lead. And I smiled and gave him a thumbs up. He stood up, clicked his heels, and stuck his right arm out. And we met other SS officers in that town. With um, so, who else? There are, there's a picture in my uh, array that I sent you of one such party. All the little, well, I can't say all, but many, many, many little towns had uh, gatherings, parties, usually on the 20th of April, Hitler's birthday. No even, way. No yeah, oh, way. Yeah, even, even way up into the middle 1990s. 
with the uh, swastika flag and a picture of Adolf Hitler. Are you kidding me? Really? No, I'm, no, I'm not kidding. Yeah, really. We've got bunches wow. of photos of these things. Wow. Wow. Okay. Yeah. Uh, very rarely am I speechless, Harry. But uh, <laughs> well, uh, this is something that I mean, it's know, one thing to speak about. You know, I'm sure they have a great Oktoberfest down there. Well, well, we have good Oktoberfest here in Los Angeles. But yeah, celebrating well, I, Hitler's birthday with 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 swastika flags. Oh yeah! Wow! Wow! And they have <clears throat> the uh, the neos. Is it, there's nobody there to complain? Nobody would. Who would you complain to? Yeah, that's my point. Wow, that's frightening. I, I, are you? Does it make you feel uncomfortable, or do you just have to go with the flow? I'm I'm accepted into the circles. Right, right, right. It doesn't make me nervous. Right. They have a big march in Buenos Aires every year uh, in December. The neos with their flags and their drums. There's pictures of that on my website. <clears throat> wow. So, and well, and the the interesting thing, everybody we talk to, the older people who who have this information, uh, they're just astonished that. Anybody has any questions about it? They all say the same thing. Well, what, what's the big deal? We knew Hitler lived here. The, and uh, the, in, uh, the, in Buenos Aires, the most upscale, super modern hotel uh, <clears throat> at the time was the Plaza Hotel, which is still a beautiful hotel. And that's where Martin Borman lived for two years after the end of the war. And he lived there with two young women. That gives him extra points in my book. Uh, so I went in there. When I was there just this past January, and I went up to uh, the lady in charge, Senora Rodriguez, spoke perfect English, very nice lady. I introduced myself, told her uh, I was doing this book, and uh, I said uh, I have found evidence that Martin Borman lived here in this hotel for two years after the end of the war. Without batting an eye, she said, oh, yes, room 740, the presidential suite. <laughs> I said, oh, you know that? She says, oh, yes, everybody here knows that. She says, we didn't know about the two young women, though, but so they knew he lived there. Um, the fourth picture, in, well, we have uh, Joseph Griner's cross here, too. which uh, Yeah, I just put that in there because um, way up the Amazon River, almost to Manaus in Brazil, there's a whole graveyard full of these. Uh, they look like about 10, 12 foot high crosses from 1936, and they all have that swastika on them. 1936, they were down there. But it's the <clears throat> it's the fourth picture here. Fourth uh, picture, which is the Argentine army. Yeah, and my point was, it looks like the German army because the Argentine army was being trained by the German army. This is 1941 photo. And with with a full full Nazi uniforms, helmets, hats, trucks, uh, rifles, and yeah. if you didn't know that this was the Argentine army, you would assume uh, that that would be a, a, a picture of the German army, right? And not only not only the Argentine army back then, but 1990 when we were still living in uh, Tampa, uh, Pinochet in Chile was overthrowing Allende or had overthrown him. <clears throat> and we're watching on the news, uh, Pinochet, uh, reviewing his troops, marching past in front of him. And the camera was behind Pinochet and he was on the left side of the camera. So you saw his upper torso to the left side of the camera, <clears throat> excuse me. And he was saluting his people and they were marching from camera left to right. And I told my wife, I said, look at those, look at those uniforms. They, they're green, but if they were black, you'd think you were in Munich in 1936. And she says, yeah, and look at Pinochet's cuff. He had a big, fancy uniform cuff, and it had the German oak leaves all around it. And right in the middle of the cuff was the Sigrun SS. Mm. My wife spotted it, pointed it out. I looked. It was there. Wow. The Sigrun SS. Now, when it comes to uh, the what apparently was, you know, safe passage for 
I, I don't know how many, uh, what, what it, it had to have been in the tens of thousands. Um, I'm yep. sure you can give me that figure that wound yep. up in Buenos Aires. But in order for that safe passage, that mass exodus to happen out of Europe after World War II and dur- before the world war had actually ended too, apparently, um, right. ended up in Argentina. Um, the reason for that is, and I'm guessing here, I'm going out, I'm stretching a little bit, but the United States had to turn a blind eye to this. And as there had to have been a clandestine agreement of some kind, because all of that knowledge and technology and science that could have gone the other way and headed east into Russia, we needed that to come west over to the United States. And that's actually what was going on. Uh, you're getting ahead of me there. Okay. <laughs> that's, that's true. Um, but you give me a holler about five minutes before you're ready to wrap up the show, and I'll give you all that detail as well. <laughs> <laughs> now, uh, moving on to photo seven, if I may. Yes, yes. Uh, I call it is, I, I call it T Island. <laughs> T Island, yeah. It's uh, it's called Trinidad, not to be confused with Trinidad. Right. And this is just a rock about a thousand kilometers out into the South Atlantic, almost straight out from Rio de Janeiro. Um, it belongs to Brazil. They keep a small group, maybe a couple of dozen. Uh, I don't think uh, they've even got any weapons. They're just sailors, and every morning they run the flag up to show they own 200 miles of fishing around there, and they haul it down in the evening. Now, the photo number seven was taken 1939 by a German contingent. Uh, 1939, the Brazilians just pulled their people off the island, and one week later, a scientific task force arrived. Well, they must have been waiting offshore because they didn't make it from Germany in a week. Right. And it was headed up by the uh, catapult ship Schwabenland and several other support ships. They were they stayed here at Trindade for a couple of years, but they also sent other ships down to Antarctica to do mapping where they were claiming Neue Schwabenland, mm-hmm. New Swabia. Mm-hmm. Um, and they would have their uh, flying boats fly along the border of what they were claiming, and every one kilometer they would drop what they called a spear, which was basically a five foot long stainless steel spike with a swastika embossed on the head <clears throat> every kilometer. And every tenth kilometer they would drop in a two meter long stainless steel spike with a metal swastika flag on it. They dropped thousands, didn't they? Say again? They drop thousands. Oh, yeah. And we've got photos of those things, too. I didn't want to overburden you, but we got pictures of their people down there on the on, on Antarctica with their swastika flag. We've also got pictures of those spears, as they call them. But now you look at number seven and that ridge where the little arrow is pointing to. Right. <clears throat> the Germans built an 80-meter high radio tower there. That's the North Tower. Then in the next picture, photo eight, that's me standing in front of what was remaining of the building of the radio shack on the South Tower, which was also 80 meters high. So they pretty well held sway over this island until 1941. Then they left. The Brazilian Navy came back. And uh, then in June of 45. The war had been the German war had been over for two months already. The Brazilians pulled their people again, and a German contingent came back onto the island. I saw the memorial to a grave of a German sailor that got killed there in June of no July of 1945. <clears throat> what was he doing there three months after the war was over? Okay, well they were providing fresh water and uh, staples two ships and submarines coming by for two years after the end of the war. This island has creeks and streams all over it full of fresh water, and they had herds of uh, pigs and goats and uh, sea turtles. So you need meat to come down and whack a bunch of pigs or goats, whatever. And uh, so they, they provided stopovers for, uh, for water and food. For, for for who when you say boats and submarines? P 
people leaving Europe to go to Argentina. Interesting. Yep. And we look at photo number nine. I'm sure most of your listeners have seen the deals on the History Channel of the of the rallies in uh, Madison Square Garden, headed by Fritz Kuhn and all those guys. This ain't Madison Square Garden. This is Luna Park in Buenos Aires. It's a huge, big place. And they had been having rallies down there, too, in the late 30s, early 40s. And uh, you see one of the pictures. There's a bunch more photos on my website. Yeah, this looks like it could be anywhere in Berlin or anywhere in Germany. Exactly. But it was in Buenos Aires. Hmm. And right now, uh, Luna Park is just a, a, a conveyance for rock stars and, and Justin Timberlake and weird people like that. <laughs> and uh, Justin Timberlake's not weird. Slow down there, okay. Harry. No, you meant to say Justin Bieber. Oh, that's the one. Yeah, I meant. there's two different guys there. Timberlake is the bomb. Okay, let's let's. <laughs> you can tell how tightly I, I know the, the rock stars. Oh, man, you, know, you just blew up Twitter. I, I can't wait uh, to go back and see what Twitter's saying. Well, I'm from back in the old days. I remember Elvis Presley. I met Jerry Lee Lewis, and uh, those were big at that time. Okay, shifting to number 10, maybe get my tail out of the fire here. Justin uh, Timberlake. Yeah, okay. Okay, Timberlake, <laughs> uh, okay number, number 10. And that is the house that Eichmann built with his two sons in Buenos Aires. Not a very big house. Looks to be about twenty foot by twenty foot. Right. And you see the swastika flag and the Argentine flag. This was flown by his son after the Mossad had come down and uh, grabbed his father and took him back to Israel. Now, uh, he was one of the very, very few who could not afford to pay for protection, like the rest did. He was a poor man. He had been the uh, guy in charge of uh, moving uh, prisoners into Auschwitz. So he was just uh, uh, either a colonel or a lieutenant colonel. I can't remember which. So he didn't have a lot of money. He had factory jobs. He had a total of three, one after another over the years. The last one, he worked at Mercedes-Benz of Argentina, and he had to ride the bus three hours each way. And so one night uh, there were half a dozen Mossad guys waiting to grab him. And you know what happened there. But his son, in protest, raised the swastika flag on their little house, and he took to wearing a swastika armband while his father was um, prior to his father's execution. So and the house is now torn down. You've heard of the, the book or something. Well, I think it was a book, The House on Garibaldi Street. Right. Well, that's where it was. But that house is torn down and the area is fenced off. And my my guide tells me that uh, if you go there at night, you better have an armored car. It's dangerous enough in the daytime. <clears throat> so it's not a nice neighborhood. And um, Eichmann used to sell uh, fruit juice down at the uh, at the marina on the weekends. So he was he was not a wealthy guy. Now next number eleven. Here's a guy I had never heard of until a few years ago. He turned up in my research. Antti Pavlik. You never heard of him? Up there. No, no. He, he was head of the Croatian fascists. And uh, even after Germany surrendered, he was still extolling his guys to fight on for a week or two afterwards. <clears throat> well, then he suddenly evaporated out of Europe and reappeared in Buenos Aires. He got a job as a bricklayer, and then through mutual friends, he was introduced to Juan and Evita Perón, and suddenly he was a general contractor with a huge big company, built some of the skyscrapers that are still in Buenos Aires today, and uh, <clears throat> it was trying to uh, rekindle the Croatian uh, nationalist movement down there, and <laughs> one day he got off the bus near his house, and there was a Czechoslovakian secret police guy hiding in the bushes. Bang, bang. Took two rounds in the back. Didn't kill him. He was in the hospital. And uh, the Allies wanted him extradited. And Perón said, no way. Well, then Perón got kicked out of power. And they were getting ready to extradite Antipavlik. 
and he just snuck out, wound up in Spain where he lived the next one or two years in a hospital and finally died because of the bullet in his back. <clears throat> Nobody ever heard of Antti Pavlik uh, at, until I started researching this. And uh, my translator and I went to the house where Antti Pavlik had lived. It was a pretty upscale house. And down there they got walls around all the houses, uh, security, I guess. So here I'm with my arm up in the air taking pictures over the fence, over the wall, and this lady, very nice lady, about 50 years old, come out and wants to know what this gringo is doing taking pictures of her house. And I explained, oh, she was so nice, told us all about Auntie Pavlik, because she and her husband had bought the house from him introduced us to the old lady across the street who used to go to the parties on Pavlik threw. And we have also just uncovered one of the workers for Antipavlik, who was building some facility in Mar de Plata, which is a resort town and also big Navy base. And in the 1950s, I think it was, I don't have my notes in front of me, but this worker said three different occasions he saw Hitler come to visit and talk to Antipavlik. It says, um, uh, I, I'm, I'm watching Twitter right now. We have some people that are listening, uh, you know, from that part well, of the world, so. from Cro- Croatia and stuff. And this is everyone in the former Yugoslavia heard that is about Auntie Pavlik. I'm looking at right. a bunch of posts right in a row Auntie Pavlik, Auntie Pavlik. Right. People from that area would, but the average American has never heard of him. Yeah, I he- never heard of him, and I do this 12 hours a day. So, uh, but at any rate, whether he was a good guy or a bad guy, we leave that to the individual discretion, but he lived there, his buildings, one of the buildings he built has a massive, huge, maybe 10 or 15 story high sculpture of Evita stuck to the side of it. And uh, just this past year, the minister of culture or whoever was going to do a big feature in town on the two strong Evitas, Evita Peron and Eva Brown. But there was a lot of, a lot of pressure. And so he decided not to do that. <clears throat> so Ava um, did that. That was another question. Uh, she did arrive in Argentina as well. Oh yes. She was there. Yes. Okay. Let's go and, to, uh, go to number 12. Yeah. Number 12. We know who that is. That's Mangala. Mengele came there, too. He lived for a short while in a very nice hotel. Then a guy named uh, Malbrank, I can't remember his first name. Malbrank owned big uh, manufacturing facilities. Malbrank was also a friend of Peron. And we have a photo of uh, Mengele on the front porch of of, of Malbrank's house. And that's on my website. And my translator took me there, and I took a, a color photo of the front porch, exactly the same as when Mengele was standing there, except Mengele wasn't there anymore. Uh, he had three houses in Buenos Aires, and one of his houses was backyard to backyard, literally with the presidential palace of Peron. <clears throat> and uh, we have just, uh, my sources in uh, South America have just found the home that uh, Mengele had lived in way in the north, north, north part of Argentina, right at the border of Paraguay. And uh, the little village right near where Mengele was living, between 70 and 80 percent of the inhabitants are twins. Figure that one out. Yeah, that's the big story. Yeah, that's the big story, the big man. Right. Well, I'm going to be there this coming March, among other places. Then we go down, photo number 13. That is the town we were talking about, San Carlos de Bariloche. And we've already talked about that. Number 14 is an SS colonel by the name of Erich Priebke. He was living there in San Carlos Bariloche, openly, <clears throat> and he uh, he was the head of the uh, German Cultural Center in this little town. He was the headmaster at the German school in this little town, 
know, one must, might wonder why you have all that stuff in a Latin community, but he was, ran a butcher shop. <clears throat> in 1995, Sam Donaldson, remember him, the newscaster yep. with the fiberglass wig, <laughs> he, he went down there and he kind of outed Pripke. Well, Pripke was hauled back to Rome and stood trial for alleged war crimes in a military court, was found not guilty, went back to Bariloche. I think he would have had enough sense to move, but he didn't. He stayed there, and doggone, certain people made a big fuss, and they brought him back, tried him in a civil court, and he was found guilty, sentenced to life in prison in uh, <clears throat> in his uh, apartment which was not a bad deal. Uh, he had a very upscale apartment in Rome, and uh, I saw pictures of the Carabinieri guards. They got women Carabinieri's, and they were pretty good-looking broad, so I don't think Pripke was doing too badly. And he got to go out and walk in the park every day, and he got to go shopping. So, And I had dinner with his son in 2009 when I was there. And there were lots of SS uh, a Waffen SS, you know, there's a difference between the Algemeine and the Waffen SS, but that's another whole program. Mm -hmm. uh, and he was one of the ones that used to go to the party with the swastika flags. He just died. I think it was this last March. He was 100 years old. And then there was a great big fuss about nobody wanted him to be able to be buried anywhere. Well, what, what do you do with a dead guy? You got to bury him somewhere. But the, uh, <clears throat> they were trying to uh, stop the funeral cortege and everything, but uh, they they snuck around and got him out. What is the uh, when when you when you're down there? What is the ultimate goal for keeping you know e even if it is clandestine of keeping this alive? I mean, are they hoping for you know a fourth Reich or something? You know, what's why why not just let it go? It, I I don't understand, and there and there is obviously a large part of the population of Argentina that is very anti everything Third Reich, like you're saying. They could even bury the body. So well, yeah, but that fuss was in Rome, not in. South but America. but I mean, but you have this like with uh, Mengele's house, you know, that was raised. So, yeah. um, so there's both sides of the fences down there. What what's the goal of trying to keep it alive? Is there any talk I, about that? I never asked anybody. Okay. Maybe I should ask them. Yeah, I would. That'd be the first. <laughs> that's the way my brain works. I mean, I, that's exactly where I would go. Either that or maybe I have an answer and I can't tell you. Okay. Well, you know, you can. <laughs> <laughs> Let's uh, look at photo number 15. Remember I told you they had these parties? Yep. And that's the Argentine flag on one side and the swastika flag on the other. And if you look closely... Look whose picture is right in the middle. Wow. Yeah. They're all over down there. Now, what they year is these, this What year is this picture? Uh, this would have been in the early war years, I'm guessing, or after the war. Uh, but they still go on today. Unbelievable. Now, when you get down to Bariloche, to get to Hitler's estate, it was on the water, and way up a finger of this one lake. You can't get to it by land. had to be by water. So you look at photo number 16. That's a watchtower. It's still standing. I took that photo myself, or my translator did, one of us. <clears throat> and if you're coming from one direction, you had to pass this watchtower. And, of course, your, your presence, your approach would have been noted to the estate. Uh, because they had armed security for many years after the war was over. That's Germans a huge, did. huge tower. It's uh, If you count the top floor, you're looking at it's four stories. Right. It's huge. And you'd have one or two platoons maybe there, you know, not to, not to engage anybody, but just to report. Right. And if you were coming from the other direction, you passed a bunker. You'll see photo number 17. The bunker was blown up in 1960 as a uh, training, supposedly. <clears throat> but the same thing. You would have personnel there to just watch, and if anybody came by, they would notify the bunker 
uh, or, or the estate. And I'm pointing at it there. I look like the, the hood ornament on a 1929 Duesenberg. Mm-hmm. Uh, I'm pointing towards the direction. It's a huge lake. It's Beautiful, a huge right? bunker, too, obviously. Yeah, it was pretty big. Yeah, it's pretty big. Now, picture 18, that is the estate. There are quite a few outbuildings and guest houses, small ones, but this this one had like 20 or 30 rooms in it. Um, <clears throat> it was built for the Mercedes people. The only people that ever occupied it was... Hitler and Eva Brown, once they moved out in 1955. Uh, <clears throat> nobody's lived there since. It looks like any Bavarian house that you would see in the Alps. Yep. And it's been sold, I guess, and resold. It's for sale on the market now. The price has been reduced from 40 to 35 million Yankee dollars. Do they have to disclose? Do they have to disclose on the real estate? Uh, you, know, do they, you, know, you know, Hitler lived here. <laughs> I don't they know just what their laws are, but I think everybody who goes there knows it. Right. Um, and it's, you know, if you've got the money, it's worth it because you've got bunches of land and there's other homes or, or guest houses around it. And on my website, you see photos taken inside the house as well. Because I, I think I mentioned I worked for a short time with the mustaches in Chicago and I learned how to pick locks. So I just kind of let myself in. Was it empty when it, when you went in? Nobody? Yeah, nobody's lived in it since 1955. It's just been sitting. Now I understand they boarded up the windows and probably the doors too. So now, uh, why? I, I'm, I want you to answer the obvious question, but <laughs> why hasn't anybody lived there since 1955? I don't know. Uh, maybe it. Maybe the answer is obvious. Maybe the other obvious answer is it costs a lot of money. It's a beautiful house. Oh, it's gorgeous, and it's right on the water. There's a boathouse. You see all those pictures on my website? Right. There's a boathouse. There's a little house <clears throat> where they built this little house right over a small thing of a stream that turns a paddle that creates the electricity, and, and another little house right near the house where the furnace is and the steam pipes come in. It's really high-tech for its day. <clears throat> so what did you see when you went in the house? Just a lot of empty rooms and some furniture no family photos nope nothing no, nothing nothing, like nothing to give anything away nope no I'm swastikas go time, i'm gonna i'm gonna take my white metal detector and see if i can find maybe a coin or two in the ground there you go yeah, yeah. i would uh something in the walls yeah yeah i would definitely check that out that's very very interesting oh it's a, it's quite it's a gorgeous house if i too bad i was Born good looking and not wealthy because I'd love to buy that place. It's uh, it's pretty big. It's pretty nice. Yeah, Thirty uh, something million Yankee dollars. So that's yeah, ooh, yeah it's hard a lot money. of that's a lot of ducks quacking in the pond. Amen. Um. Okay. Now, okay. Next. Nineteen. Nineteen. All them guys walking up the stairs. There's an island in this little lake called Hoymel Island. Not little lake. This big lake. It's a small island. And this is Dr. Ronald Richter one of Germany's top nuclear scientists, and they built a nuclear research laboratory on this island two years after the end of the war, 1947. Aha. Uh-huh. Uh-huh. And, and photo number 20 is uh, the reactor building. Do you know everybody well, that's in, in picture 19? No, the only one I know is the guy at the very far left, the top of the stairs, that's Dr. Richter, right. Ronald Richter. <clears throat> but there were so many who decided they didn't want to go to the U.S., didn't want to go to the Soviet Union, and went down to South America. Professor Kurt Tank, for instance, the guy who designed the Focke Wolf FW-190 fighter plane, he went to South America, and some 50 aeronautical engineers came down there with him, and they were designing fighter planes for the South American countries, primarily Argentina, um, Three of the top best-known Luftwaffe pilots came down there. One was Hans Ulrich Rudel, who won uh, a, a special award that was made only for him. If you were a superstar, you got the Knight's Cross with oak leaf, swords, and diamonds. Well, they made another one for him, made it in gold, because he had 
<clears throat> he was a Stuka dive bomber pilot. He had sunk a battleship, sunk a cruiser, destroyed more than 500 Soviet tanks. He went down there. Uh, Adolf Galland, the guy who was in command of all the jet squadrons, and he had shot down, I think, 102 or 104 planes. He went down there, and Werner Bombach, who was commander of uh, Kampfgeschwader Bomber Squadron 200, which is where all the secret planes were, he went down there, and they reorganized the Argentine Air Force. Uh, Werner Bombach, unfortunately, was killed. Uh, they had a, a Lancaster bomber down there, and they were training Argentine pilots, and they, they crashed into the Rio de la Plata, and uh, Bombach couldn't get out. Plane sunk and took him down with it. Picture but, picture 20? 21? 20. 20, yeah, that's the ruins of the uh, reactor building. All the buildings from the laboratory are still there, and for some reason... <clears throat> Only the, the reactor building was blown up, as you see there in 20. The rest of the buildings are just standing. There's no wood left, I guess. Maybe the termites got it, or maybe they used the uh, wood for something else. But the walls are still standing, and all the other buildings, Dr. Richter's house is still, the shell is still standing. <coughs> Excuse me. And uh, you have to, well, the, the island is uh, under the, control of the prefectura which is their version of the coast guard so we went there and there was a petty officer and a rating a sailor came out and stopped us at the dock and wanted to know what we were there for etc well i was a flotilla commander with the u.s coast guard auxiliary so i showed him my id oh yeah welcome to the island <clears throat> so we took pictures all over the island that's on the website too uh what did they use, what did they do at these laboratories? Well, it's reported that they had the first and probably only cold fusion, but that's kind of wrapped up in uh, plus and minus. Uh, Churchill once said that the truth is so precious that it must be <clears throat> protected by a bodyguard of lies. So, did they really achieve cold fusion, or? Did they not, as other reports say? I think they probably did. But uh, And then right after Perón fell out of power, <clears throat> the funding stopped. And so uh, Richter went off somewhere else and just faded into anonymity. What did you see when you went through the labs? Big empty buildings. Not a damn thing left in them. Uh, how, how, big were although, these, how big were they? <clears throat> some of them were pretty doggone big. Uh, what are we talking, uh, like 60 feet by maybe a hundred feet and very high. One building was very strange. It had a whole lot of square holes through the wall and, uh, we're not sure, but we think that is where they housed the so-called Nazi bell, die Glocke. but that's a subject for another whole, another whole series. Well, we could stay on it for a few minutes. Let's, uh, uh, what were the rumors about the Glock being there as opposed to being researched back in, in Germany? Well, it was in Germany first, but then uh, not rumors. We uh, we know that it was there. Um, there were three giant aircraft built. You'll see a picture of them on the front cover of my book, Photo 1 in your array. <clears throat> that was the uh, Junkers Ju-390 six engine they only built three of them and they, they were numbered v1 v2 v3 uh v3 never got totally finished and by the time the allies overran them v1 had flown um i think down to johannesburg and back it can fly forever had so much fuel and then v2 was built about three meters longer and so it had longer fuel tanks more fuel capacity <coughs> And as the war was just about ended, they uh, took the props off of V-1, put them onto V-2, and flew them out of a little uh, airstrip. I think it was called Sidelitz. I'm not sure. It was near the Romanian border. And uh, they were surrounded by the Red Army, and there were 
thousands of some of the best Waffen SS troops holding the line until they could get out with this plane. There were some Ju 290s also that got out, but this 390 flew down to Uruguay and landed on a 15 kilometer long stretch of highway. Uh, and there was a, a small woods at the end of the road, and they put up a, a, a radio direction finder there so the plane could find its way in. And uh, <clears throat> we have drawings and maps and charts that are in my book also, showing the town, near a town called Mercedes, or pronounced in Spanish, I think it's Merced. Uh, and so I'm going to be down there in March into this little town, talking to old people if I could. And uh, <clears throat> But as for what the bell did, uh, the world expert on that is a guy named Igor Witkowski. He's a member of Shark Hunters also, and I was supposed to see him next week when I'm in Europe. But unfortunately, I don't have the time or the bucks to make that extra trip. Uh, but you're saying uh, uh, de Glock was flown um, out of uh, Bavaria down to Uruguay? Out of Europe, down to Uruguay. Right. And then, and then the airplane was broken up and pieces scattered so nobody could find it. Wow. Um, and then wound up on this island. Yep. Mm. Mm-hmm. Hoymel Island. Now, where it is now... All I was told is that it is still under control of Dispina. I will Odessa. find out more when I go down there in March. And Hopefully I'm coming back. And when you do, you're going to be on this show. I can promise you. <laughs> that's fair. That's, uh, <laughs> that's, uh, that's an amazing, uh, wow. Wow. Okay. All right. Let's go to 21. 21. The Eden Hotel. It had been built around the end of the 1800s, and uh, it was upscale, <clears throat> and about 10, 15 years before the war, it was bought out by the Eichhorn family. Eichhorn is the German word for acorn, and uh, especially the wife, Ida Eichhorn, sent a lot of money to Hitler when he was a young politician on his way up. And then when he was making speeches in Germany, the only place in this area, which was in Cordova, 400 miles northwest of Buenos Aires, the only place that could pick up the overseas radio broadcast was the Hotel Eden, and they would pipe it to the courtyard. And we've got pictures on the website also, hundreds of people sitting in the courtyard listening to Hitler's speeches, and there's other photos of the courtyard as it sits today. The hotel is in kind of ruins. Uh, But they have uh, letters there, handwritten by Hitler, thanking Ida Eichhorn for sending him all this money. And they show that to the people. And there's also an FBI report saying that uh, they knew Hitler had come to uh, visit the Eichhorns after the war to get some help. Now, uh, I stayed there um, just this past January. They have an outbuilding called the Annex, which has maybe 10, 15 rooms in it. Beautiful old place. My room had big double doors that were like 12 feet high. And this is where Hitler stayed when they came to visit some years after the war. And we got an interview with a waitress named uh, Catalina, what the heck was her last name? Gamaro, I think it was. And she waited on Hitler and Ava Brown in 1949. And I, I, yeah, that, that interview is in the book as well. Why do you think uh, it is so difficult to dig up this information? You know, you have to go down. Why isn't... Why isn't mass media themselves looking into this? And, you know, they have well, to that, leave it to research. Yeah, uh, they leave it to researchers like you and, and shows oh, like and they this. Won't even listen, uh, they won't even listen to me. You know, we're trying to get on some of the major shows. No, they don't want to hear the truth. Now, I remember during the war, we were fighting against Italy, Germany, and Japan. 
after a certain point when it was obvious we were going to win the war, uh, the press then had us fighting against Hitler, Tojo, and Mussolini. They had personalized it, I think, so that <clears throat> they could rebuild the countries and just point the finger at Hitler, Tojo, and Mussolini. Now, Mussolini, there's no question what happened to him. They hung him up by his heels in a gas station and machine gunned him. Uh, Tojo, no question there either. He shot himself, didn't get the job done. We nursed him back to health and then hanged him. Seemed like a waste of time. But Hitler, though, <coughs> they, they manufactured this story about the death in the bunker. Even the Russians didn't believe it. The Russians were telling the world it wasn't true. But why? Here's here's the wrap up here. We, we, I, you know, we can get to, to photo 22 later if you want. But <clears throat> invariably, people ask me, well, why didn't they go after him? And I, I always ask them, well, who is they? Oh, uh, they stumble for a minute. Well, um, Israel. Why didn't Israel go after him? Well, there was no such place in 1945. Israel didn't come into being until 1948. <clears throat> oh, well, uh, uh, the Mossad. Well, I tell them that if the Mossad even existed back then, it was tiny. Plus, uh, they had, you know, their own building of their own country. And then but, they, somebody would but, say, they, but they had no problem going after Mangala. You know, that was 1960. Yeah, well, that's the point. But here, here we're wrapping, coming down to the final... <laughs> yes. Punchline or whatever you want to call it. Uh, when I was uh, a young punk in the Air Force uh, from January until June of 1958, I was in intensive training for special weapons, um, thermonuclear weapons, <clears throat> and, uh, you know, hydrogen bombs, atom bombs, etc. that we're all going to drop onto Moscow. And Part of the training, the first few weeks, we got to watch the movies of the early U.S. nuclear uh, program. We were in trouble. We didn't have hardly squat in the way of fissionable material. Uh, <clears throat> Japan test-fired their first weapon a week before the U.S. test-fired our first weapon. Japan didn't have any more fissionable material. We didn't have any more. Then the war ended, and suddenly, wow, our scientists got really bright, and we had all sorts of fissionable material, and we're finding out now that it all came from Germany. And uh, in the next issue of our magazine, uh, we're showing exactly where the fissionable material came from. Uh, we publish a monthly magazine, and if your listeners would like a free copy online, just send me an email at sharkhunters at earthlink.net. Say they would like a free copy of the magazine. We'll zip it right out to them, no strings attached. Uh, but we theorize, we haven't proven it yet, but we theorize <clears throat> the deal was made. You leave Hitler and the rest of these guys alone, and uh, we'll give you all this stuff. Now, there's one more step. Uh, Peron became ultra wealthy because of the Germans down there, and he was protecting them to the max. So uh, Eichmann, okay, nobody cared about Eichmann. They sent in a, a half a dozen people. They grabbed him, took him out. But if they wanted to come in and get Hitler or Bormann or Mengele or any of these people under the total protection of Juan Perón, they would have had to mount uh, an invasion because Perón wasn't going to give these guys up. And... That, that's the theory, and I think it's a good one. Hmm. So hmm. they didn't go after, the U.S. didn't go after him because we had the agreement, and they also realized that if you did go after him, it wouldn't have been successful. Well, I, got... yeah, and, you know, the thing is, right after World War II, obviously we needed our rocket program and, and right. jet engines and airplanes and technology and, and certainly – physics and nuclear stuff, all of that was in play. But after we got everybody, after Operation Paperclip was done, then yeah. then at that point, why, why not go in after Hitler and, and, and well, Bormann? I can't and, answer that. I don't know. Incidentally, the reason we couldn't get the uh, 
our atom bombs to function properly was you have to have 64 shaped charges around the nuclear ball, around the uranium, and they all have to be detonated at exactly precisely the same milli, milli, millisecond, otherwise you don't get nothing except a mess. One of the guys who was coming over on a submarine, U-234, was the boat and got surrendered in the U.S. because the war ended was Dr. Heinz Schlicker, who also became a member of Shark Hunters. He's the guy that had developed the proper triggering mechanism in Germany, and they gave that to the U.S., and then they had a bomb that went boom over Hiroshima. Incidentally, that's Hiroshima. It's not Hiroshima like the left-wing lamestream press likes to call it. Mm-hmm. I asked one of our Japanese members, I said, is it Hiroshima or Hiroshima? And I think the guy is still laughing. Uh, so who, <clears throat> okay, why, uh, is is that the, the actual conclusion is that it was either us or them, I'm talking about the Soviet Union, and do you think that the Soviet Union would have given them the same free ride? You know, was there like a race to to these scientists, there's no doubt that the Soviet Union did get their share, um, right? But but was there a race, and who had the uh, the better agreement with Germany? A- and when when did the agreements actually go down? Was it a year before the the war ended? I mean, they knew that the war was lost a year before. You know, oh yeah. So when did all of these agreements and back channel conversations start to happen? We don't we don't have that at this point yet. Um, what's his name? Uh, uh, Himmler Himmler allegedly was making his own deal with the Soviets to try to get to you know save his skin. Right. And various others. Uh, Dernitz was accused of it, but apparently didn't do it. Yeah, Germany uh, had technology way beyond anything anybody else had. The Soviets wanted it. We wanted it. Most came to the U.S., some to the Soviet Union, but a bunch went to Argentina. Now, when uh, Winner von Braun came over, he had 40 tons of documents for the research. Holy smoke. You know, so he had a pretty big stick to carry. Yeah, and that's the the whole other thing with von Braun. You know, I'm on... I'm on the fence about that, but you know we had to do. I guess what we had to do. It's a. Uh, it was a very uncomfortable thing. I had read something. Somebody should post this on Twitter. That um, NASA uh, decided not to put any Nazi affiliation of Von Braun on any of the plaques or anything or anything official. Um, I thought that that was a uh, uh, pretty funny. You know, just well, it, it was pretty well all staffed by uh, lots of German. Scientist, the guy who was head of NASA in the beginning was uh, Dr. DeBoose, and he was part of the rocket program at Pinamunda. Yes, he was. And uh, one of our members, Mark, um, oh, what the hell was his last name? Mark McClellan. He was an engineer with NASA for like 35 years, I think. And uh, this is another mystery. What happened to General Hans Kammler, who was the third most powerful man in the Reich because he was in charge of all the secret projects, jet fighters, rockets, uh, intercontinental missiles, et cetera, et cetera. He disappeared and alleged was uh, committed suicide or was shot, whatever, but that's baloney. He came to the U S because when, uh, Mark was in Dr. DeBoose's office, he was introduced to Dr. Kamler. Well, the, his his death. There's like four different versions, correct? Well, I've heard three of them. <laughs> yeah, there's like three, right? Yeah. Um, and uh, and yeah, almost th- no photos of him. There's no, I've only seen three photos of Kamler, and I don't think anybody has seen any others. Has anybody yeah. in Shark Hunters spoke to you about Kamler? Well, just uh, Mark McClellan, right? And he, yeah, he's a member of Shark Hunters. I had lunch with him a, several months ago. And he was introduced to Kamler. Yep. Wow. And to a feller named uh, Dr. Green. And uh, Dr. Green, which is Green, was the code name for uh, uh, Heinrich Mueller, Gestapo Mueller. 
Photo 22. What have Photo we got 22. here? Photo 22. This is an interesting thing. This was the Hotel Vienna with one N, V-I-E-N-A, built in the closing months of the war with German money in a tiny little town called Miramar, right on the edge of a great salt lake. And it had modern amenities that they just didn't have in 1945. They had elevators, they had air conditioning, and they had a plastic surgery clinic. And uh, <clears throat> Excuse my, me? A, a yes. plastic surgery clinic? Yep. Uh -huh. Don't you find them in all the resorts you go to today? Yeah, yeah, every one where I need to change my identity. So yeah, every... Everybody checked into this hotel was waiting for some surgery to be done. That was the I reason. For, that was the reason for the hotel being built. Yeah, this hotel also had a sixty-meter-high lookout tower. What the hell do you need a lookout tower for? And this was out in the middle of nowhere. Miramari is is out where you know there's a sign that says a thousand miles to nowhere. This is it. Was there a uh, town? Is there a town here? Yeah, small town. Small town. Maybe so, maybe four or five hundred people. And so what's the reason to build a resort? Yeah, exactly. So <clears throat> even up to 1960, this place was going in full swing. We just heard from another one, one of our members whose father was very high up in the Third Reich, and his mother had a pup that came from Hitler's dog, Blondie. He was there in 1960, and he said the place was still going full tilt and... So was the plastic surgery clinic. Do you have any old pictures of this? Yeah, not too. I, I don't know where where I have them. I, I think I've seen one or two old pictures. It was really a plush, beautiful place. But then, in the late sixties, I guess for some reason, the Salt Lake just started to rise. You can see it in the background there, and that's where it had been when they built the hotel. But it started to rise and rise and rise, and it flooded all the way up to the ceiling of the first floor, huh. which destroyed the place. Right. Well, then it receded, and uh, we went there. We had an arrangement with the lady who's in charge of the place. <clears throat> we got there about noon, called her up, and she said, well, she's tied up. We should have lunch. Okay, so we had lunch until 1, and then she said, well, she couldn't get there to, to show us until 6 o'clock at night. And I'm thinking, what the hell? We drove three hours to get here. I don't want to just sit around town doing nothing until 6, visit the, the hotel until 8, and then drive three more hours back to our hotel. <clears throat> so uh, the place is surrounded by 8-foot-high wire with uh, a chain-link fence with razor wire on top. But like I say, when I worked for the mafia, I learned how to work locks. So I let myself in, and another fellow came in with me, his name also happened to be Harry, and he was a uh, U.S. Navy fighter pilot in, in Vietnam. So we went all through the whole hotel, took bunches of photos. We never take any souvenirs or touch anything, because that's just wrong. We take photos and films. And <clears throat> those photos are up on the website, too. And uh, we finally left, went out, got in our car, and we were heading across the Pampas about an hour later. And my my guide, his phone, his cell phone rings, and oh, see, si, Senora, por favor, and he's talking. And, oh, oh, so he's panicky. Oh, no, por favor, Senora, no, no, policia, no, policia. She was going to call the police on us because we had let ourselves into this destroyed old hotel, which incidentally did have a bunch of German photos on the walls, and uh, you'll see those on my website too. Uh, so finally, well, she asked how me and the other Harry climbed the fence. <laughs> and uh, my guide says, well, uh, senor, they're both old men. I don't think they climbed the fence. So uh, we made a deal. She wouldn't call the police if I told her where was the uh, chink in her security. <clears throat> so where we made is the deal there. Oh, so from 1955 uh, to 1963, um, uh, Adolf and Ava are running around Argentina together. Where did they go after the uh, Mercedes house? 
Well, after 1955, they were up in the area of these two hotels. They didn't live in the hotels, but they lived up there in Cordova. And Hitler died, like I say, we believe, we're trying to narrow it down, 1962 or 63. As of the year 2002, we are quite certain Eva Brown was still alive, uh, which is no big deal. It would have made her 90 years old. And as of two years ago, we just have <clears throat> thoughts that she was alive two years ago also, which would have made her 100, which, again, is not impossible. My what? granddad's older sister was 104 when she died. Who uh, uh, who can you reference? I mean, how did you find out that, or, or where are you getting this information that Ava Brown is still alive? A couple of different of our people down there who don't know one another. We got it from two different sources that I can't go into. Okay. And um, do you know what city she's living in? Uh, no. Okay. All right. Hmm. Ava Brown is possibly still alive. Yeah, I would, I would not think she was still alive now because uh, it'd be 102. But who knows? Like I say, uh, Captain Hardigan is 101 and still driving his own car. Right. My granddad's sister was 104. Right. Um, yeah, no Lady question. Riefenstahl. I don't know if you ever heard of Lady Riefenstahl. Of course. Great okay, director. Well, she was a member of Shark Hunters until she died. She was 101, one week past her 101st birthday. She was still scuba diving and mountain climbing. Did you ever meet her? No, darn it. Every time, well, this was before the days of email, I would send a fax over and say, for a reef install, I'm going to be in Munich, such and such dates. I would be very happy to meet you and have coffee. And I'd get an email back from one of her people uh, Frau Riefenstahl is uh, diving in the Red Sea, or Frau Riefenstahl is climbing in the Himalayas. And mm -hmm. Tough broad, tough broad, and she was gorgeous. Yeah, We've she, got a bunch of films that she made that we uh, we sell on DVDs. Yeah, she, she dropped she, dead gorgeous, and, and her, her one most famous movie, Triumph of the Will, the, that those techniques are being taught even today in cinematography schools. And if you... If you look closely, like my wife did when we took our kids to see The Lion King, you can see the influence there. Uh, there was a scene where Scar, the evil brother, was plotting with his three hyenas to kill the king and take over. And he said, there's going to be a new beginning. And all of a sudden, uh, he's on this rock and it turns into a, a pinnacle. And the, the cracks on the side of the rock are the SS Sig runes. And the, the torch is down below and throws his shadow on the wall behind him, and it's the black eagle, not a shadow of a, of a lion. And now the three hyenas are a whole legion of hyenas, and they're goose-stepping across uh, a checkered pattern, just like uh, at the, uh, in, in Nuremberg. Then in Romancing the Stone, where the, no, I'm sorry, Jewel of the Nile, Jewel of the Nile where this evil Persian dictator is having himself proclaimed Grand Poobah or whatever. He's got this huge big eagle made out of looks like pipes or whatever behind him, huge, massive thing. And if you look at the 1929 Nazi Party rally, they had a big eagle exactly like that. So, and when she did the Olympics, uh, her her techniques were were incredible, and and people are are using them today. Yeah, if she would have, uh, you know, if she would have left Berlin and came here to Hollywood, and and you know, that's what she really wanted to do. Yeah, she would have influenced uh, everybody. Yeah, she was definitely. Yeah, she was a brilliant woman. Yeah, she was ahead of her time. Um, yeah, and, and she was gorgeous too when she was a a movie star. We have um, uh, we're we're at the end of the program. I will say this uh, first off. Thanks for coming on. But I want to uh, I'm going to open up the phone lines to one phone call. One phone call three two three eight two five fifty forty five. Make it a good one. I'm going to take one phone call uh, for Harry Cooper. Hey, Harry, what can we? 
you know, after everything that uh, has gone down in history is written, what they've written, what I mean, and the mistakes that were made and it was all tragic. And I wish World War Two never happened. And we all know that. But what can we what can we learn from everything as we walk away from this? You are as close to the fire as anybody. Well, the biggest thing I learned is that uh, uh, wars are just a, a total waste of uh, people, et cetera. Um, and like I say, we find out we're not different. We just wear different uniforms. When I went, I'll be quick with this one. When I went over to the Soviet Union the first time, I attended a round table. They love round tables. All these admirals, and each one is asking me through my interpreter a submarine question. And all the time, this steely-eyed guy across the table is just staring at me. <clears throat> Came his turn to ask a question. Only he asked, "Why did I come to Moscow?" And so I, I pointed at him. I said, I was told you're my enemy. He got very stiff in his chair. And I said, but you were told that I was your enemy. And he nodded. And I said, but I don't see an enemy. I just see another man who wants his children to grow up in peace. And he, and, uh, he smiled. And I said, so let's drink with Pepsi, a great American invention. He says, no, we drink with vodka, a great Russian invention. I said, okay, see, we're friends already. And just like somebody threw a switch, they all started smiling, got out of their chairs, came over and they were taking their medals off their uniforms and pinning them on my jacket. We were not different at all. We just wore different uniforms. And the people in charge were telling us who to hate. Exactly. That, that's well, that's, that's very true. Uh, hi, you're live on Fade to Black with Jimmy Church and Harry Cooper. Who's calling? Where are you calling from? Hi, I'm Joe from Whittier. Hi, Joe from Whittier. How are you? Everything good? Good. How about yourself? Everything's excellent. How are you doing today? It's uh, another good show. What, awesome. what have you got for Harry? Yeah, just wondering if um, he would know where Hitler's uh, remains might be and if uh, we could get any DNA to confirm it. That's a great question, and I was going there myself. Thanks, Joe. Are you going to take it off the air, or do you want to stay with us? I'll take it off the air. Okay, you got it. Repeat the question, please. Is that, kinda... Oh, he said, uh, "Where, where is, where are Hitler's remains, and are there, is there a way to do any, uh, you know, DNA to prove that it is him?" That's a question that I stay away from, and I can't tell you the reason why. Okay, well, okay. Well, th so then you're saying that you. That's that... the only question that I haven't answered for you. Yeah, right. And you've done great. <laughs> So you're saying, I'll answer for you then, um, <laughs> that you you do or somebody knows where the remains are. You're doing the answer and I'm okay. just listening. Okay. All right. So somebody knows where the remains are and it would be possible to get some DNA testing done. How who would you bump? Who would you bump the DNA against? Uh, you, well, um, there must be something left from Hitler, um, World War II. Some what, hair. Pump it against the relatives. What relatives? Yeah, that's uh, that's another good point. His, his mother and father are buried in Austria, but the politically correct clowns in Austria, about four years ago, took away the grave marker. So now they're just in an unmarked grave. I mean, we know where it is, and they could dig it up if they want. But who right. who wants to disturb dead people? And his son died way back in 1958. He had a son from uh, a little tryst in World War One. So who are you going to who are you going to compare it with? Well, that's true, but certainly I think we should. If he, you know, if he did survive, you know, past the bunker, um, I think uh, we need to know, and it's our right to know that that is actually what happened, and he oh, did wow. wind up in Argentina. Let's take one more. <laughs> yeah, let's take one more quick call. One more. I'm, <laughs> I'm feeling nice tonight. This is Fade okay. to Black. You are live with Harry Cooper and Jimmy Church. Who's calling? Where are you calling from? Uh, yes, it's Steve from Bluefield. Hey, Steve from Bluefield. How are you, sir? Doing good, buddy. How are y'all tonight? What have you got for Harry? We got we got two minutes. Go ahead. Harry, um, what did you find out about secret bases in the Antarctic and some of these guys making it to there instead of Argentina? Okay, that that's a question I get asked a lot. Um, Thanks, Steve. I, yeah, thanks, Steve. I'm good. I know. I know. There's a lot of rumors, um, and anytime we find a lot of rumors, if we dig into it, usually we find some kind of fact. However, digging into Antarctica 
is just an incredibly expensive thing. Uh, when I go to uh, Argentina, for instance, for two weeks, it cost me about 10000 bucks. When Now, to go to Ar- Ar- Antarctica, uh, I belong to the Adventurers Club in Chicago, and I used to have dinner with Charlie Walgreen. You know, he owns a bunch of drugstores. When he was turning 90, he and a bunch of his friends wanted to fly down there and have a glass of champagne at the South Pole. So they chartered a C-130, flew down to the South Pole, got out, had some champagne, lit candles, got on the plane and flew back. It cost them $30,000 per man. So to mount a decent expedition down there a couple of months long, oh, man, you're looking at quarter million, half a million dollars. And uh, where do you go to get that? I tried to get grants for this from the federal government. <laughs> and and I know my congressman real well. I'm on his Veterans Advisory Board. He couldn't get me any money. So it would be nice to be able to get down there. But you got to get an angel that's going to write a very big check it's a big chunk of land too i i looked at some maps of new schwabi land of uh, in uh, in antarctica right. which is it finland who has it now norway i can't remember uh, i don't know but uh, I, I understand that antarctica is about three or four times the size of the u.s it's a big chunk down right. there plus uh, they've got it so so locked up with international treaties you're not even allowed to go there without all sorts of permissions and if you say you want to go anywhere other than where the touristy kind of people go i'm sure they would not be happy about it but then again i i I never ask for permission anyhow i figure when i see a sign that says ein gang verboten most people think it means entry forbidden but i think it means harry's welcome here do you (laughs) do you that's good do you think that there is a a clandestine uh, uh, submarine base down there that they they obviously they tried to establish something in in the 30s, uh, do you think anything lasted after World War II? I don't know. Operation, uh, what the heck is High that jump, thing? high jump. High jump, yeah. That, uh, there's a lot of theories with that. That uh, uh, I haven't studied this real tight like I have the rest of this, but uh, I'm told that uh, England sent three different expeditions down there before high jump and three more after high jump and all got run out early. Got, there was a shooting match. Early. Yeah, they they traded they traded some fire apparently. Supposedly, yeah. I like I say, I'm not an expert on that, so uh, you know, I'm not going to make any flat statements because I just plain don't know. Uh, it wouldn't surprise me now when when Don Angel said that he met with Hitler, he said he flew down to Antarctica, but <clears throat> I am convinced that was typical spook type disinformation. Because he described all the buildings and everything, and it and it describes the uh, Mercedes estate down there by Bariloche. And I'm quite certain that uh, <clears throat> he landed in Bariloche, not Antarctica. I got to thank you for coming on tonight, Harry. I had a great time. Yeah, it was fun. Yeah, and after your next trip down to Argentina, come on back. We'll we'll chat then. But also, I, I, I'm serious. We just we need to put some side put aside some time for racing. I can talk that <laughs> all night long. It was it was it was great having you out tonight. Thank you. All right, my pleasure. Harry Cooper, everybody. Sharkhunters dot com is where you want to go. All the pictures are there. And uh, again. Thank you, Harry. It was a great conversation. Yep. You have a great evening. You too. Thank you, Harry. Bye-bye. Bye-bye. Ah, there you go. First night of Third Reich Week. Uh, Nancy, I did see your uh, your comment. Yeah. It's, uh, I'm, I'm, I'm right with you. Uh, this is Fade to Black on the Dark Matter Radio Network. I've got to take, you know what, can I take a break? This is Fade to Black, only on the Dark Matter Radio Network. I'm your host, Jimmy Church. That was Harry Cooper. Hitler survived the war and went to Argentina. Unbelievable. Got a bunch of email. I'll try to get to some of that when I come back. I'll be back right after this. Stay with us. Hi everybody, this is Rob Halford, the Metal God on JimmyChurchRadio.com. What's up? My name's Brian Taylor, Ninja Badass Extraordinaire, and this is JimmyChurchRadio.com. 
KJCR in your face. JimmyChurchRadio.com on the Dark Matter Radio Network. All right, fade to black. Wow, what a way to kick off the week. I'm with you, Brian. Where did all the time go? And here we are at the end. You know, this is the thing for me, and I'm not glamorizing anything about the you know Third Reich or Hitler or anything like that. But Harry touched on a couple of uh, interesting points. You know, everybody's just wearing uniforms. You know, that's what what went down in World War II was bad on all sides. And uh, I saw the post earlier about, you know, how many Russians died, you know, tens of millions. United States, yeah, half a million uh, lost. All, all of it was bad. But the thing is, when you look at modern movies, now now stay with me on this. Look at something like Star Wars where it's obvious, you know, uh, what's, what's going on there. And, but who did you always, you know, uh, <laughs> you always wanted to be a, uh, the, you, you wanted to be with Darth Vader. I don't know. You know, did you, did, did you want to be on the good side or the bad side? And, um, I forget, uh, the guy's name, the guest that we had on, um, maybe six months ago, who, when we started to talk about uh, Nazi UFO technology and and die Glock and and other things, he was like, "Man, you know, I just don't want to glorify. I don't want to give anything. I don't want to glorify the Third Reich. I don't want to make them look like." And I, and I said to him, "Look, you know, they had the cool guns. They had the cool planes. They had the cool tanks. They had the cool uniforms." You know, it, it's something that is, is it, it's strange, but it's there. It's not me. It's, it's everybody else. And I had to make that point very clear. And when you have a conversation like this tonight, as uncomfortable as it can get, it's stuff that needs to be discussed and not forgotten. We can't erase that. We can't. It's it's stuff that has to be discussed. Uh, World War II was was horrific, it was absolutely horrific. But then the United States turns around and makes these back channel deals with very very bad men, very bad men. But without that, you know, and that, that decisions were made. And it's crazy as we find out more and more. Somebody had posted, actually, uh, about the Vatican or about the Catholic Church. Um, And there was a lot of, you can do your own research on this yourself. But all those identities, I started to get into this with uh, Harry. Uh, We got sideways in the the conversation. But uh, the... Uh, the identities were created, uh, a lot of it was, you know, done apparently by the Catholic Church as well and spirited out of, you know, we, we know about Mussolini and, and what was going on in Italy, but all of this was going on and everybody ignored it. It was, uh, it's a very uncomfortable thing. In the United States, we did what, I guess, what we had to do to get that technology. And if we hadn't have gotten it, somebody else would have. And it would have ended very bad. It's, uh, it's a crazy part of history. I don't even know. Uh, I, I, you know, I don't even know how else to look at it. You've, us or them is the way to look at it. This email came in. Uh, from Demi, and he says, if the master race and the German superiority was still a goal, why would the Germans work with and even help advance the Argentinian military and society? Uh, were they just a stepping stone uh, back to power? Well, that was my question. And is that going on down there now? You know, I, 
I would love to go to Argentina just to just just go visit as a tourist, but observe, just kind of look around and see what uh, uh, what is really going on and what the attitude is. So, oh, and the the Hitler doubles, absolutely. Was that a double that uh, and that came in from uh, King B? Uh, was that a double that was uh, uh, in the bunker? Possibly. Did Hitler leave uh, Germany way before that? Absolutely. Possibly. It's, a, it's another thought. This came in from Cortana. She's tweeting now, the Nazis had all the sharp uniforms and all the cool stuff by design. It was propaganda to join the cause. Absolutely. Absolutely. DTAP says, I'm a weirdo. I wanted to be on the good side, except for any relations with those Ewoks. <laughs> Uh, T-Tap says, I did like Cobra over G.I. Joe, though. Uh, I'm just, uh, I'm going through, you know, shiznit, <laughs> Leslie. The Vatican was number one supporter of the Nazi party for a long time, even after World War II. This is stuff you can go research yourself. Absolutely. Absolutely. Boba Fett. <laughs> The Russians had six doubles. Wait, wait, wait. The Russians had six doubles turned over to them in the bunker. Little known fact. Is that true? Is that it? I did not know that. Send me your info on that. That's that's from Walter. The uh, this is from Lou. The irony is how poorly their army did in rescuing Israeli hostages during the Olympics. No, Lou. Lou, you're a little off on that one. Hugo Boss did the Nazi uniforms. <laughs> oh, goodness. I got to thank everybody for uh, listening all around the world. I was watching the numbers get posted throughout the show, and uh, absolutely extraordinary night tonight. Tomorrow night, let's not forget, we will have on uh, Joe Fex. Joe has tons of... When I say tons, I'm not saying this tongue-in-cheek, tons of UFO photographs. We have a bunch of galleries that have been sent to us. We will get those up tomorrow. I'm not going to do that in advance of some amazing photography uh, from uh, uh, the collection of Wendell Stevens and uh, a bunch of Nazi UFO technology. These are photographs. Personally, I have never seen. Some are around the web now. Some. Wait till you see what we've got for you tomorrow. And if there wasn't something going on over there, uh, something. They knew something. The question is, where did they get the technology from? Thank you, Harry Cooper. And uh, who called in tonight? Steve from Bluefield. Joe from Whittier. Joe's a new caller. Thank you. Stay tuned. Coming up next is The Unexplained with Howard Hughes. Not the Howard Hughes. Special thanks to Keith Rowland and Art Bell. Fade to Black's executive producers, Rita Kamarian. Show is produced by Hilton J. Palm and Mark D. Kovar. The announcers are Steve Harder and Mark D. Kovar. Music is Doug Aldrich. Show intro is performed by Spaceboy. Fade to Black is produced by KJCR for the Dark Matter Radio Network. I'm your host, Jimmy Church. Tomorrow night, day two, Third Reich on Fade to Black. I'm your host, Jimmy Church. Be safe, everybody. See ya. See ya.